4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Bueno, pues muchísimas gracias por estar en esta segunda parte de, de la sesión de hoy. Eh, esta, esta segunda parte ya involucra la, la escuela de verano, entonces ya vamos a iniciar con otra dinámica. Recuerden, es más de lecture, más, más de clase, hacer preguntas. Al final, el doctor Helder les va a hacer un examen, un test, como el de ayer con el doctor Sharma, los que estuvieron ayer. Ok, so. We are starting the lecture, uh, this really nice lecture with uh, Dr. Helder. So I will just quickly introduce again doc, Dr. Helder for the ones that, did, that weren't yesterday. So Dr. Helder Santos is the head of the Department of Biomedical Engineering and also head of the Translational Bionanomicro Thera Generative Medicine Lab. All of this in the University Medical Center Groningen or University of Groningen, Groningen in the, the Netherlands. And well, Dr. Helder is an expert in nanomedicine in general. So today his lecture will be about it. So let's give a applause to the Dr. Helder, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Armando, for the kind introduction. Um, buenas tardes. I hope you had a nice lunch. And you are now with all energy for the afternoon session. Um, so um, those of you that attended my lecture yesterday um, already uh, learned about some things that what we, what we do. Um, but I learned yesterday that uh, you had different backgrounds. So we will do it uh, um, more on a, a basis, basic lecture today. Uh, but before that, um, let me see if this works. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> so what I would like you to do is if you could go to this uh, um, website, Menticom, and introduce this code here. Uh, and then if you could throw keywords to answer this question, I would be very happy to show you here on the screen. Let's see how this is going to work. First, if you get the code. Let me see if we can get it there. So to the website over there. And great. So please, anything that comes to your mind that you can imagine that you have, what you have learned in the past days. It's anonymous, so you can share whatever. So let's see what's coming up from that. You will notice that the, 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 the word that is always in the middle uh, is actually the, the ones that it's repeated the most. So the bigger letters are the ones that are mostly written to uh, by you, actually. So let me come here to see what is coming there. Small nanomaterials. Drug delivery. Yeah, great. So while you are throwing, I, I will just summarize more or less what uh, what everyone is showing here. But what it comes up from the from this exercise that something that is small that is used for therapy, nanomaterials, uh, um, uh, drug delivery surprisingly is is not one of the um, the bigger uh, uh, keywords showing up there, at least not yet but uh, health, nanomaterials, small, and therapy. So great, thank you for sharing, that's good. You can still throw up that, it will go all the way. Let me try to go back. Our drug delivery now has increased, so thanks a lot. Okay, so. 
So yes, um, so uh, nanomedicines are indeed very small particles. I already showed you uh, some things yesterday. And basically what we do, we can design them for precise medicine. Uh, to transport, as you can see here, a particle to transport uh, uh, drugs, for example, this is a, a porous particle that has been uh, um, modified with a target entity. We call them GPS of these particles. So exactly as you have it in your uh, cars. Uh, and then if this GPS is actually very well coordinated, maybe a little bit better than the Google one, uh, the Google map. So we can actually go to the right place uh, uh, and deliver your drugs, uh, um, navigating through the, um, to the bloodstream. Uh, of course, you have the uh, possibility to visualize it as well. So here, what, what you see is that we designed this particle to navigate to cardiovascular disease. And then because we have these shiny stars here, actually they are not shiny stars, they are, they are tracers, radio tracers that we incorporate in these particles. And by doing so, we after the injection, we can see where do they go. So you see um, anatomically, this is a rat. So you see that in the liver and spleen gets a lot of this, but you can see also that in the heart, we can get an accumulation of these particles. So the better you design your particle, the better you, your GPS it is, the more you can get accumulation of, of these particles to the, to the right organs that you want. So this is what uh, target therapies are all about. Uh, and you can do it with different materials. We can do it with different uh, uh, carriers. Um, so for the students, I would um, give you some literature that I find it very interesting. I also use it in my lectures. So these are uh, very good books, large books. Um, most likely, I don't know if you have access to these books, but if you don't, just ask me. I can give you the PDF, but don't tell anyone. Um, and uh, um, oh, don't tell uh, at least uh, to Elsevier, most of these. Uh, these are also my own books. So you can get the um, them also from me because I have all this, these PDFs as well. Um, nevertheless, you can then look to the, to the books overall, especially if you are interested in the, uh, in the materials design uh, and also how this has been used for bi biomedical applications, but also for pharmaceutical applications, for example. So let's go back to basics. So uh, I, uh, you are chemists, uh, physicists, um, pharmacists, and therefore it's, it's very important to put some definitions here. So most of you probably have, have heard about the Nobel Prize uh, physicist Richard uh, uh, Feynman. Who has not heard about him? You have not heard about, okay. So uh, if you go to YouTube, he has most of the fantastic lectures that you can ever uh, actually uh, learn uh, and watch. Uh, and he was uh, the one that uh, coined the term, there is plenty of room at the bottom. And basically he was talking about nanomaterials. Uh, uh, and, and after that, uh, many of the researchers actually tried to find out what was, what was existing at the bottom actually. Nevertheless, so you already heard that for to, to, um, to go over certain barriers, so the blood-brain barrier, the intestinal barrier, whatever barrier that we have in our bodies, particles have to have certain kind of sizes. And one thing is that if you want to get inside of the cells, the other thing is that if you want to get into the nucleus, okay? So nucleus is even, uh, the pores of the nucleus are even smaller, and therefore it's very difficult actually to get there. So... Um, when you look to the properties of this material, so everything counts here. So size, shape, charge, and so on. It's very, very important that you have to control it all the way. Um, you're, some of you already saw a very, very uh, similar picture yesterday from me. Um, so basically, if you have the pencil here, you know that we are talking about uh, materials, nanomaterials that are very, very small. Okay. Uh, more, more importantly is that the nanotechnology or nanomedicines is not something of a unique field. You can see here, it can be from, it's an association from chemistry, physics, engineering, biology, you name it. It's a very multidisciplinary field. And, and it's the reason that in many of the presentations that you saw from, uh, from us, from Groningen, our groups have a multi, they are multidisciplinary. Uh, we have engineers, we have uh, uh, biologists, 
Uh, we have uh, um, chemists. Myself, I am a chemist as well. So uh, uh, it's a kind of intersection of all these uh, uh, all these fields. Okay, but basically, nanoparticles are defined as if they have. Uh, um, 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 in one of the dimensions can be diameters with length uh, from uh, what, between one and 100 nanometers. So you will see that many times we also use the term uh, nanoparticles uh, if they uh, uh, if they have like let's say 500 nanometers as well. But anyway, if one of the the, the, the truly definition is 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 is, is this one. Um, so then it gets a little bit more complicated as well because the U.S. use certain kind of definition and then the European Commission also use a, a slightly different definition. So if I'm not going to read it through, but basically they kind of match uh, in certain aspects, but uh, you need to be aware of where you are uh, because some of, of the organizations, FDA, for example, uh, or EMA, the European Medicine Agency as well, so they might use the different definitions and I will come back to that later. But it's good to, to know if you want to to market your product product in US or in Europe then you have to take into account that some of the definitions might slightly be different um, so when it comes to uh, uh, pharmaceutical development so many of the current big pharma I'm talking about uh, uh, Novo Nordisk uh, I'm talking about Russia I'm talking about uh, Novartis they have in their pipelines uh, pipelines, some uh, drug development using nanoparticles, using nanocarriers. Um, um, and as you can see here, so uh, to produce something to get to the market, you see here, it, it typically takes about 12 and 15 years. And you can see here, this is in euros. It, uh, currently, I think it's about 3.2 billion euros, right? So if you go to the um, uh, um, drug research where you... Um, get the compounds and then you test all the way and then you get one approved drug so this is how long it takes so what we are trying to do is we are we are trying not to uh, to invent the wheel anymore so we take something that is already approved and using the nano carriers we try to make it better so what we usually say we try to give to the existing drugs a new life um, and of course, uh, because the drug is, has uh, already been approved, you have to demonstrate much less of the uh, uh, of the process in order to get to uh, uh, in order to actually to get a, a faster approval to the to the market. You still have to do it, but then you can shorten that. So anyone knows what was the uh, the nano carrier that was the, the probably the fastest ever in the history to get from this point here, or at least from the, the drug research development here to actually to approval? Yes. Yes, exactly. Thank you. So the COVID vaccines, so this was something that was unique, extremely neat, and it, it went all the way. So no need for 12 years, otherwise we would have a very much in problem. So as you can see, when there is a huge need, um, the process can go faster, but typically this is what pharmaceutical industry is using. So how it works, it's very, very simple. Uh, you have a medicine, you put it inside of a tiny particle. Uh, it, well, here it's a porous particle because I like porous. Um, but basically, and well, when you join these two, you can create in a very rough way uh, a nanomedicine, basically. So it's a nanoparticle containing a drug molecule. It can be a biological, it can be something else. Um, so they are very tiny particles. So you don't see it, I already told you. So if you imagine one uh, human hair, so it's uh, um, 80,000 um, nanometers wide, a nanoparticle is between one and 100, or at least in one dimension. So you can see how many particles actually you can fit uh, in one human hair, right? Really a lot. So here you see some of our particles. These are actually inorganic particles. The different color means that they have uh, different sizes. So by, by you looking to the color, you can immediately see that you have produced something with a different size. Uh, and here what you, what you see is what we call the, the nano-earth. So this is actually um, a, a particle. 
uh, they are actually two particles. So uh, uh, we have a polymeric particle, and inside you probably don't see it. We have an inorganic particle, a bit shade, and here we uh, we have what we call, what I call the 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 nano moons. So they are actually uh, uh, gold nanoparticles that we are able to control and to uh, assemble on top of this big nanoparticle. Uh, and here, what do you see? It's also a nanoparticle, but this. This has been actually, um, th this contains the biological material. So actually this is made of uh, a cancer cell membrane uh, material and we can make a part as well. And then you need a big microscope like this. We call it transmission electron microscope. Who has used the one in this room? Okay, great. So these microscopes are meant to actually uh, look very much into uh, into small particles like this. Okay, you can also use other kind of other kind of techniques, but this one is the most used, basically. Um, how they are being used before COVID, by the way, it's, let me let me uh, tell you. Before COVID, most of these particles were in clinical trials, and as you can see here. Most of the class were in cancer, and then a very small uh, uh, non-cancer non related. And you can see what kind of particles they were, metal nanoparticles, oxides, polymers, lipid, uh, liposomes, uh, protein-based nanoparticles. Um, and then, of course, nowadays, what uh, uh, most of the, of the companies and also researchers are trying to do, like we are doing also in our group, is to extend this from cancer to also other disease. So what are the big advantages of this uh, nanoparticle? So why do we use this uh, drug delivery system? So you see some of them here. We can improve the delivery of very poorly water-soluble drugs. So typically it works very nicely for those. Uh, we can also enhance the cell specificity or the tissue specificity to target different compounds. We can also enhance the transport of different drugs across different barriers. Uh, delivery large molecules or small molecules, basically. So you, we can talk about uh, uh, large molecules like RNA, for example, or even uh, large peptides like, like or proteins like insulin. I will show you some examples. Or then you can even co-load. You can co-deliver more than one drug molecule actually there in a, in a single particle. Okay, and then you can also, as I as I mentioned, if you attach an Im imaging modality, you can even follow where the particles go, and you can even have a real time reading in vivo. So this is very important. Of course, pro probably I should have put this in the very beginning. Everything that you do has to be non toxic, non immunogenic and biodegradable in nature. Of course, we already learned from Teo yesterday that some, everything will always induce some immune response, but what you want is to minimize that. Um, so in the very beginning uh, of my work, of my research group, what we did actually was a little bit of what is described here in, the, in, in, in these papers. So we did a lot of nanotoxicology. So I had a question yesterday from one of you. Um, so basically what we did, we were looking into different sizes, different shapes, uh, different surface chemistries, and we were testing different compositions of these materials, particularly this silica, but also carbon nanotubes, different ones. And we were looking into screening with a lot of different cell lines from uh, primary cells to second, secondary cell lines uh, in order to evaluate what, which materials were uh, safer and which, what, which dose we could use and so on. So it takes a lot to do this, uh, but you have to do it at some point, one way or the other, when you, when you want to move to the market, for example. So um, we already discussed about, uh, uh, about the, the different nanoparticles that can exist. So you see here the most common ones that uh, uh, most in, uh, from our uh, group, in, uh, from our department, we are, lo we are looking into polymeric particles, liposomes, nanoemulsions, uh, nanogels, and so on. Uh, but there are many other ones that you, you, we, can, we can use. So micelles, for example. Uh, so uh, depending on what materials you use, um, you can, and if you can form nanoparticles, they can be tested. What they, you have to be sure is that they, uh, uh, they, they take into account the previous uh, criteria that I tell you, because if they don't, then they will not go very far. 
So uh, I already told you this also yesterday, some of you. So it, the idea is to make these drugs more targetable. So uh, everyone here in this room already had a headache. And usually what you do, you take ibuprofen, paracetamol, and that will have no consequence. And typically you have to take more than two pills, right? So uh, um, if we can make it more targetable, then of course you will minim you, 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 you can use less doses and you can have a much faster and much specific uh, uh, a result. Uh, so um, many many people might wonder, well, why why to use a, a nanotechnology? And I usually I usually tell them why not, right? So if it can help else us uh, solving some of the medical problems, then there is a big solution there. And now we know it after COVID as well. So, but the beautiful of this is that uh, of these particles is that you can create different carriers with different physical chemical properties, okay? And that's why it's very important that in your teams uh, you have different engineers or chemists and so on, uh, because, well, they will understand a lot of the uh, engineering of these particles, maybe the biologists, what you put on the surface. Uh, but then when you want to test them, maybe pharmacists are good at that, uh, or if you want to test the interactions with the, uh, with the cells, then biologists will be very much interested. So it is very important to take that into account. Why? Uh, also because when, uh, one thing is to produce these materials, the other thing is to, uh, to test them in an in vitro or in vitro setting. Okay, so you can have the most advanced nanoparticle, but if it fails around here, then well, you are doomed. You have to find another way out to how to prepare these these materials. Okay, because uh, um, at the end of the day, what you want is a, a particle that has the excellent in vitro properties, pharmacokinetic, pharm pharmacodynamics that can really, uh, and biodistribution as well, so that it can really be used for uh, pharma pharmaceutical application. Um, so here I, I show you some of the, uh, uh, of the properties, size already said, surface charge, shape, which most of us, or engineers, usually uh, um, uh, don't pay so much attention, but is as important as all the other parameters, is stability and storage. Okay. If you produce a material that after you put it at rent, uh, room temperature, it aggregates, that's it. It doesn't go very far. Um, you can do whatever you want. You can try to sell it. Uh, it, it, it doesn't help you. Uh, so also remember, when you go to a human application, you have to be able to sterilize these materials one way or the other. If your material is not, or it, it doesn't stand sterility, then you have, you have another problem again, okay? So you have to pre-think about this uh, in advance, or you have to be sure that when you design these materials, they fulfill, uh, well, ideal all the criteria here, but if not, uh, uh, at least the most important ones, it, uh, it's, it's a must. Um, so, a uh, few years ago, even before COVID, we already had some problems. So, there was already a, a paper published in Nature Nan Nanotechnology with uh, Frank Corozo. I was with him in, in November in, uh, um, in Australia. Uh, and they, they did, uh, th this was a very impactful paper, actually. There was, I don't know how many citations already now. But basically, what they realized is that uh, scientists were not very good at reporting all the experimental details. And therefore, when we try to reproduce the data, the literature data, most of the case we uh, found very different variations in the, in, the, in the synthesis process. So together with a lot of scientists, well, myself, I am there as well, but together with the groups of scientists, we, we did a, a kind of a report uh, um, um, uh, assessment or basically acknowledging that we should do much better than this. So we should make a, a better uh, transparency and reproducibility of the nanomedicines that we are putting to the li literature. So if you are writing your paper and you think that, oh, the volume is not so important, what is important is what I'm mixing. Don't do that. Put there 
what kind of conditions you are using, put there the masses, the volumes. Because if someone takes it and cannot reproduce it, it's a waste of the time. So this is what we now encourage more and more. And this is actually what this discussion was a few years ago. This was in 2019, uh, that we try to uh, encourage uh, everyone actually to, to do them much better. And if you don't put it in the main text of your papers, at least put it in the support information. That is very important, OK? Um, so, okay, I already told about that. Uh, another thing that I want to, to tell you, so the main problems about the nano size systems, of course, nothing is, is perfect, okay? So don't, uh, even what I showed you yesterday, uh, uh, there are some issues to get to those data, okay? So don't think that, oh, it's so beautiful, everything works and so on. That's not the case, okay? And don't get the, the wrong impression. So there is a physical chemical instability, the drugs that can leak out of these carriers, particle agglomeration, this is one of the most problems, for example, sedimentation, and, and then other ones that you, come, you can also come is scaling up. So most of the things that we discuss with different researchers is that one day uh, when we start to discuss, I, the, I have only two questions usually that uh, I, I have to them, uh, is that one, how much can you produce? So if they usually tell me that, uh, I, well, I can produce a few milligrams, uh, it's very good for research, but it will never get to the market, okay? So when you discuss with the pharmaceutical industry, they, 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 they want to hear kilograms at least, if not tons, okay? But at least kilograms. If you are very far from that, they will tell you, okay, continue your research. I've been there. I've been discussing with very different pharmaceutical industry. I went there, I present my data, all the beautiful in vivo data and so on. And they asked me, huh, how many you can produce? Milligrams, okay. See you next time. So this is one of the problems, okay? So scaling up is also very, uh, very important and you need to think it also how to scale up. I will show you in the second part of my talk what we can do about that as well. Um, so this is something that you need also to think when you are working with these materials. Uh, because if you want it to move to the next level and the next level means to create a product, these are the things that you have to overcome one way or the other, okay? Um, so to solve these problems, you can do many things. So uh, the nanoparticle stability, you can of course decorate the nanoparticles with pegylation, for example. This is very standard. You can you can add some surfactants to uh, to the to the to your solutions like PVA polymers, for example. So you can do that a lot because this reduces the uh, electrostatic interactions, and then you can get better. But there are many other strategies, but you have to be sure that they are really stable. So if you produce your nanoparticles. You put it in the fridge, next day everything has sedimented, so you need to think that, okay, this is not 100% uh, uh, stable, so I have to go to the board again. We have done a lot of this. So now I come back to the, to the targeting. So there are typically two types of targeting, uh, passive targeting, active targeting. Who has not ever heard about these two terminologies? Okay, good, because you will know it now. Um, so passive targeting is something that you have a particle. Uh, the particle is small enough to navigate and go through, for example, uh, uh, the, the, if there is a cancer, for example, that it creates some holes in the, blood, in, the, in the blood vessels and it can na navigate through and reach to the tissue. So this one here, uh, um, was invented by a Japanese uh, scientist, uh, unfortunately just passed away. Uh, and currently uh, it has been put to a, a stake because uh, most of the scientists believe that passive targeting doesn't exist. Uh, and therefore now it's, it's, it's basically uh, a little bit, or many are trying to understand why is that. Uh, but at least from the very beginning, this was the only thing that existed. So the particles were small enough to navigate and reach the, the tumors, for example. So active targeting is something that you help the particles to get to the place. So for example, you have a particle here, we have a targeting uh, ligand here, and by doing so, then we can stack these particles to the cells, right? So basically, if you imagine, if you have a key, if you have your lock, you can just stack it there, and then it will go inside of the cells. So this is something that you do, and I will show you uh, in the next slides how we can do. So you also learned yesterday about from Theo's uh, uh, lecture that uh, uh, what happens if you inject something to your body, Anyone knows? 
Yes, very good. So you have the the macrophage. You have the the the. Uh, the, the, the self-mechanism defense of our body, that basically everything get, that gets there, they try to remove it out because they consider that is, that is a, a potential threat. Okay, so, uh, and therefore, uh, the, the, pro the protein corona that Theo was uh, uh, um, um, telling yesterday is also one of the biggest challenges when we're trying to inject these particles into the bloodstream. Um, so to do so, we, what we can is decorate these particles with something that at least minimize this protein corona formation. And you can do it with the pegulate, part, uh, pegulate pe uh, peg, for example, uh, that is a polymer, but also you can do it with different other modifications on the surface. The idea is that to minimize that as much as possible, okay? You can never get rid of it, but at least you can decrease the interactions, the protein interactions with the surface of these particles. And if we do so, then you can get more of these particles to the right place, okay? Um, so, in terms, what typically what we want to achieve is something that is long circulating, and this is typically particle size dependent. Okay, so if you have a big particle, it's going to be easier recognized by the macrophage, for example, and it will go remove faster. So you can see here that small particles typically uh, they are lost uh, uh, um, through extravasation, okay, because they are too small, and usually they are removed also through the kidneys. Uh, large particles, so more than 200 nanometers, they usually are actually captured uh, and, and also taken by the macrophage. Even though we have demonstrated that this uh, uh, applies, for example, for particles that are not modified with, with pegulation, then you can minimize this, okay? So ideally, uh, uh, oh, the particles between 70 and 200 nanometers, they show the longest circulation time. This is the ideal size. This has been shown from many studies that if you have particles between those two sizes, actually are the best, okay? Again, it depends on the material that you are using sometimes, okay? So don't take this for granted. Don't take everything that is written in the papers for granted. Um, and then, as you can see here, the, the ones between 10 uh, and 17 nanometers, they can even penetrate the capillary vessels. And sometimes this is also very important for uh, immunotherapeutic applications, for example. So um, you already learned uh, um, or you have heard about different kind of, uh, I call it DDS. So these are drug delivery systems. And you see here, many of them listed here. And you see here what are their, uh, their properties, okay? So uh, um, depending what you want to do, uh, you have to be wise and select the, the compounds. So for example, uh, if you want to do imaging, most likely you would look into iron oxide nanoparticles. Liposomes as such will not help you there, okay? If you want to, to use um, hydrophilic or hydrophobic drugs, so liposomes could help you a bit. Uh, silicon particles are very good with hydrophobic drugs, but if you want to use hydrophilic, forget it as well. So it's very difficult unless you do some magic there. Um, so also, depending on you, uh, if you want to give them uh, uh, intravenously or if you want to, to give orally, so you need also to think what kind of... Uh, 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 drug deliver system you want to use it, okay? Because some of these you can get to small sizes, like gold nanoparticles, for example. You can get to very small sizes, but liposomes is, is a bit more tricky. And silicon nanoparticles is also a bit more tricky, okay? So it's really, the, you have to think beforehand how you make the selection of these materials for your intended purpose. And there are beautiful mat materials, biomaterials, that everyone is researched and everyone is doing. Now, the problem comes when you want to go to the uh, medical applications, okay? We already know that some of those materials will most likely never get there when, uh, uh, because, of, uh, uh, because they are metallic nanoparticles and no pharmaceutical company wants to even to hear about metallic uh, uh, nanoparticles for drug delivery applications, for example, uh, unless you prove that the metal is really, really self, the bioaccumulation doesn't exist and so on. So you really have to think very careful what you select and what you use for applications. So in Europe, I don't know if you have something similar in Mexico, uh, but in Europe, we have the nanomedicine agency, so it's the nanomedicine European technology platform, where actually you can get 
a lot of, uh, 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 first of all, all the European projects that are working on nanomedicine, um, and also what kind of uh, uh, what kind of materials they are used for. So it can be for delivery to the back of the eye. It can be for pulmonary delivery. It can be for um, uh, um, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and so on. So it really depends on the. Um, on the application, but we have this kind of platform platform that actually uh, uh, collects uh, uh, all this kind of uh, uh, information from the different projects that are around Europe, basically. And then we have the European Medical Agency that is similar to uh, uh, to FDA, basically, but from Europe, where you get all the information of what you have to do in order to get a nanomedicine to the market. Okay, and you would be amazed what you need to do. So there are about 147 pages at least that you need to fulfill. Okay, and this means from the synthesis of the process, the process synthesis, the uh, in vitro evaluation, the in vitro characterization, the physical characterization, sorry, the in vivo evaluation, the dose, the purity, the purification, the storage, Everything has to be there in that document, okay? So uh, um, uh, if you are working on the product development, then you really have to look into the uh, agencies uh, uh, at the very early stage. This is my advice to you. So start to talk with them at very early stage because they will demand some of the um, they will demand some of the um, um, results that you have to present and you have to show in order to get it to the to the market. Okay, so it's actually a very heavy process. Uh, and of course, if you go to US, there is also a very nice page that you can go to FDA, and there there is also the regulation on nanotechnology products, medical devices as well, using nanotechnology like biosensors and so on. So, uh, um, because if you want to patent there your product, then you have to look also into beyond your where you are located. So you have to go also internationally. So, and some of them they have different kind of uh, uh, criteria or, or different different kind of, of requests. Mostly is similar, but there are some specific ones um, uh, that you have to demonstrate all the way as well. So this is very important to take into account. Okay. So uh, I already told you. So there are multiple uh, possibilities to load the drugs inside of the of the materials. So you can have. Uh, drugs go into interpolymeric matrix, or then you have hollow capsules, or then you have porous materials as well that you can use. So depending on what you are synthesizing, so you can have different approaches, okay? And all of this, they give you also a different uh, uh, release rate, okay? So if you are looking to um, a very slow release, maybe the polymeric nanoparticles or, or, or hollow capsules are very good, but this one here will give you a very fast release. For example, okay. So if you want to use this for slow release, forget it. You have to do something there. So again, you have to think also what you want to. So if I am a headache, I want something that acts very fast, right? But if you are talking about diabetes, we don't want patients to inject themselves all the time. So you want something that is very, very slow releasing, for example. The more, the slower you can get, the better it is. Um, let me go back to cancer. So um, I probably don't have to explain you the, the, the basis of the conventional cancer chemotherapy, uh, but, it, but it's nasty, okay? So uh, uh, there are a lot of side effects. There are a lot of difficulties to, uh, for the chemotherapy applications and so on. And therefore, that's why, of course, using cancer nanomedicine is, can at least improve some of this. Uh, but I, I'm not going to focus on that. Uh, I would just want to show you what passive target, active target, and triggered release is actually, okay? So I already told you that here in the passive is more about the size. So you can see the nanoparticles navigate. They can go through the, uh, the holes in the, in the, in the blood uh, vessels, for example, and reach the cancer tumor. If it's active, they can actually uh, hook uh, to the cells and they, they can get inside of the cells. But then we have trigger release as well. So what does it mean? It means that you can use an external uh, uh, effect. So for example, light. So Ali showed you that you can do trigger release by the, using the hydrogels and so on. Um, what you need to consider is that one thing is that you do it with the light on your skin and it works perfectly. 
the other thing is that if it's a tumor very deep in the tissue, and then you have another problem, okay? Because the light is not strong enough, or if you, you can use a, use a powerful laser, but then you will burn all the way till you reach your tissue, okay? So you need also to think these very small details because this is very important. Another way, of course, you can use magnetic field, as I showed you yesterday, or then pH, for example, and then it becomes easier as well. So you need to, sh to think where and how uh, because one thing is to do a topical administration, the other thing is to do uh, a very deep in the tissue administration. So all this counts. So um, let me go back here. So um, I already show here. Uh, then once you reach the cells, and you already heard something this morning, once it reached the cells, there are many ways how the particles can go inside. And then you need to think about two more things, is that if your drug needs to be here, in the cytoplasma, or it needs to reach the nucleus, okay? Because one thing is if it reached, it has to reach here in the, uh, uh, in the cytoplasma, uh, you need to get rid of, uh, so, okay, let me go one step back, maybe it's easier. So uh, the, the particle gets to the surface of the cells, the cells will take them in one way or the other, the mechanism, and then you, it, it usually goes to this, what we call endosomes. Okay, they are small vesicles inside of the cells. And these vesicles are very powerful. Why? Because they have a very low pH, typically below 5.5. Uh, and uh, um, they basically try to destroy everything that goes inside of the cells because of course they think that is uh, very harmful, okay? So your particles have multiple ch challenge. First, they need to reach the cells. Then they have to go inside of the cells and get rid of this uh, um, endosomes. And once they get, they are in cytoplasm. So then they have to release the drugs. And if your drug needs to get to the nucleus, it has to go all the way through all the, the mat matrix that is inside of this of the cell into, into, to get to the nucleus. It gets so complex, okay? So uh, um, you have to be aware that uh, there are uh, some of the things that you need to avoid in order to get your drugs to function. So that's why many years ago, what the researchers were trying to do, they were trying to encapsulate DNA uh, so that they could get to the nucleus. And after many years, they realized that was a mission impos impossible or very difficult actually to do. So that's why you know what you see. Uh, like Moderna and so on, what they are doing, they are encapsulating RNAs. Why? Because they, you have to, to get only to the cytoplasm, okay? And there you can do all the job. So it becomes, uh, uh, you need one step less and therefore it becomes uh, easier. I, I say it easier, but it's not uh, that easy anyway. Uh, oh, sorry, just to let you know, the mechanism uh, of, of this, what happens inside of this vesicle is called proton as, uh, as sponge hypothesis. And you can read about that, but basically it's, it's, it's a mechanism where uh, uh, your particles will be stressed with a very low pH so that they can, well, be destroyed. Uh, and therefore what we do is that we design particles that are against that, uh, that kind of stress so that they can be released, for example. Um, active targeting, so what we look into is that uh, many uh, different cells, they have different expression of proteins or different kind of uh, ligands on the surface, okay? So it could be uh, proteins or gags or anything else that you could, uh, you could hook your particles here uh, on the surface. Um, the bad news is that, for example, when you're talking about cancer, uh, there are many cancers or similar cancers that express exactly the same kind of receptors. And then you have a, a big problem there. Uh, why? Because then it's not so specific. So what we, we try to do is we try to discover uh, um, uh, um, specific uh, moieties or the specific ligands on the surface of the cells so that you can then generate this, uh, these ligands that you can uh, connect or chemical modify your particles so that then it's become specific for these particular cells, okay? So this is also what, uh, what, uh, what we try to do more and more uh, all, all the time. And the trigger release, I already told you, you can use a lot of different ways. So uh, magnetic field, light, pH, ultrasound. So ultrasound is very useful because you can use it very much in the clinic. The uh, medical doctors use quite a lot. So it's, it's very, very important. Um, but again, uh, when you are using, uh, as I mentioned, some of these, uh, uh, you have to be aware that if it reaches the, the, the particles when they go very deep in the tissue or not. 
Um, and then you can make even more complex uh, nanoparticles like here, for example, so that you have different kind of surface modifications. So sometimes you want to target more than one receptor or you want to target more than one cell with the same particle and you can do that of course it becomes complex uh, and one thing that i have to tell you um, is that uh, um, when you are designing complex systems like this they give great papers you saw my list of the uh, covers in the journals last uh, uh, yesterday right uh, when you start to talk with pharmaceutical companies and the, the moment that you tell that the synthesis of your nanoparticles or the modification process and so on involves several steps, they also turn again your back to you, okay? They want something that is done as fast as possible, as simple as possible, and as cheap as possible, okay? So even though, and I, I'm telling you by experience, I have sat with the, uh, the big guys of the pharmaceutical companies. We have shown that our data is much better than the, what they have in their, in their uh, pipeline. And they told us, yeah, but your product will cost us 10 times more and we want all the profits. So, um, okay, you, don't, you should not say that out loud. But anyway, they, 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 they see that uh, it... Um, it is not beneficial for them to spend more money, even though it's much better uh, um, uh, outcome, uh, because that becomes too demanding also for them. Okay. So, but just to let you know, of course, you you can still do it, uh, but uh, uh, be aware of that and don't be so disappointed if sometimes they turn the back. Uh, it happened to me all the time sometimes. Uh, so I show you here one of the studies that we did. Ah, well, in cooperation actually with Bayer Pharmaceutical Company. Um, so they came to to my lab and they were interested to to develop nanoparticles using different polymers uh, um, because they had a specific drug. I cannot tell you what is the drug, um, but uh, basically. Basically, they want us to create uh, um, a kind of uh, a polymer or some uh, by using nanoprecipitation, and that's what we did. Uh, and the research questions was that uh, how can we control the size, the shape, and how we can control the size distribution using these uh, um, polymer blo blockers, basically. Uh, and one of my students uh, actually is. He has moved now to buyer, so that's that's the thing. You train a student, he learns everything, and then the company just uh, you know, takes him in because now the company has all the knowledge and can do everything that we just did in the lab. Um, so uh, what he was do, uh, studying is the self-assembly of amphibolic blo uh, block copolymers. This uh, has been uh, very much studied in the literature, but each block copolymer is a specific one. Uh, and therefore, it requires a lot of effort to develop this. So uh, um, I don't know if you are familiar with the block of polymers, but basically, depending on the on their structure, you can get different kind of of particles. Some of them are more uh, uh, rod-like, some are spherical, uh, some of, of them are smaller, bigger. So depending on the size and how this uh, hydrophilic, hydrophobic. Um, parts of these uh, uh, copolymers they have, you can produce different materials. Uh, it, it, it becomes more challenging when you try to do in, in the particles. So, because when you try to go from this hydrophilic, hydro, hydrophobic kind of structure, uh, uh, you need to be aware of, uh, you know, what kind of solvents you are using, water, the water content and so on. So we did a lot of tests uh, and we actually designed this uh, very specifically uh, um, that actually everyone can reproduce, even the company. Um, so there is a term uh, dynamic equilibrium that you need to be uh, aware between the polymer, between the water content and so on. And we wanted to study this very, very precisely. I will just show you uh, uh, the mapping. So we did a very uh, detailed study of uh, what fraction of the polymers you can use, what parameters, the, the size, the PDI, and what effect it, um, it has during the fabrication and the, the, the polymer fabrication. And what we observe here, you can see here how it is by using different polymers, different combinations, you can get better poly, uh, poly dispersion of these polymers than others, it, different fractions of the polymers and so on. So this is a tedious kind of uh, uh, experimental design that you have to do it, but you have to do it. So there is no other, uh, no other way. 
because at the end of the day, the, uh, the, the companies and also uh, the, the, um, the regulatory uh, uh, entities, they want to understand why you get to a very perfect particle. It's not, it's not enough that you just got a perfect particle, a ah, perfect size, perfect PDI. You have to demonstrate the process to get to the perfect particle, actually. Okay? So this is very, very, very important. So we study all that. Um, let me see. Does it go? Yes. So, and we, what we realize is that by changing the fraction of the of the polymers, we could go from fibers, nanofibers, to more uh, uh, round shape, even this very strange kind of formation. And we saw that by adding more water or less water, you could increase the stability. So this tells you about the stability and polydispersivity of your, of your nanoparticle. This is something very, uh, very important. Uh, so as you can see, but ju just by changing the fraction of the polymers, you can uh, uh, get different configurations, OK? Um, and then, of course, because uh, my student was extremely interested to, to combine, so if you start to put everything in a table, you, in, you, you, you end up with an endless table. So you need to look into a more a statistical approaches like this one. So these are a, a PCL analysis. So that where you, what, you, what you do is that you plot more than one parameter in this, and then you get this beautiful kind of uh, 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 distributions that what they tell you is that which one of the parameters has more effect in the production of your particles, okay? So these are statistics statistical models that you can use. Yes, please. No, we have not used machine learning in this case, no. This is called a PCL uh, uh, analysis that you can do. Uh, PCA analysis, sorry, PCL, uh, a principal component analysis that you can do, that you can relate many different uh, 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 parameters at the same time. So here we have several parameters. You can see one, two, three, four, five, six parameters that you can correlate at the same time. So we have not used machine learning in this case, OK? Uh, and then you can, of course, uh, let me go move forward. So, um, okay, that was it. So that you can understand what parameters can uh, uh, can affect your your um, uh, uh, the the fabrication process of your particles. What is the time, please? So I have been talking for one hour, right? Yes. Okay. So then I will skip some parts. If that's okay with you because I, I have a second part that I would like to talk, um, and I'm getting too late for that. So um, let me go to this uh, second part of my talk, uh, and I would like to introduce you to a technique called microfluidics. Who has heard about microfluidics technology here? Okay, great. Um, so, Again, if you go to uh, menti.com menti and you introduce this code, um, if you don't know nothing about microfluidics, try to guess. Um, but if you know, uh, please throw some keywords there. Let me see if I can find uh, just a second. If I can find, just one second, I need to find the presentation. Okay, I think that will show up now. Yeah, so um, let's see what you think, what is uh, microfluidics technology. And uh, um, microfluidics technology is used for, um, um, well, let's first see what it comes. So flow, nanoflow, microchannels, good. Oh, you, reproducibility, great, I like that. Um, laminar flow, whoa, you know a lot of microfluidics. Um, pressure, vacuum control, okay, yes. Stability, okay, good. Um, who answered laminar flow? I'm interested. You did. Okay, you did. Have you, are you working with microfluidics? No. Oh, wow, impressive. Um, good, uh, but yes, so nanofluid, 
uh, um, flow, reproducibility are some things that micro channels good. So those are some things that uh, um, you can use with this technique. But uh, that was not what I wanted to show you, of course. So let me go back to my presentation. So <clears throat> what you, most of you probably are doing, if you are not working with microfluidics, you are, you are doing what at, in the pharmaceutical uh, uh, jargon is a, 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 a batch manufacturing process. You mix things, you, you wait for a while, and then you get the results afterwards, right? So that we call a batch uh, uh, method. And basically, it means that uh, um, after your reaction or whatever you are producing, uh, then you, uh, you, you collect at the end. So with microfluidics technology, so um, because we are working quite a lot, so we like to do that. So what we do, it's a continuous manufacturing uh, process. What does it mean? It means that as long as you have things in, or you, you, you keep feeding your process, it never ends. So it can continue for whatever, uh, for days, for months, for whatever. So, and why this is important? So you go from uh, bulk, uh, to a continuous production. And why this is very important? Well, because then you can produce much more, obviously, uh, and also because then you can uh, decrease the batch to batch variations and obviously to scale up your production. So this is exactly what I was trying to tell you uh, uh, um, uh, in the very beginning. There are ways how you can scale up or increase the reproducibility and microfluidics is one of these technologies, for example. I'm not saying that is the only one, but it's at least the one that I like to use the most. Uh, so when I was, um, when I started as a group leader, I spent some, some time in Harvard in the Professor uh, David Witt's lab. Professor David Witt's lab is an expert on microfluidics. He used more for uh, emulsions, nano emulsions, micro emulsions. Uh, he has a small company also that is, is uh, uh, cooperating with Chanel. So who is using Chanel, the creams? The creams here, who is using creams? You are, you, uh, yeah, for moisture and so on, you are using? So do you know that those creams, those emul emulsions, nano uh, emulsions are created by microfluidics? Did you know that? No, now you know. So some of the, the, all these screams from motion and so on, the emulsions that are actually created with microfluidics technology currently, or at least some of the companies are using this uh, uh, more than the others. Um, so I learned all this. I brought this to Helsinki and now I have it there also in Groningen. But basically you, you are, uh, um, we work at very small uh, scales. We use glass. So typically there are commercially available microfluidics, uh, like the precision nanosystems. Precision nanosystems are, are the ones that uh, Moderna used to produce the, the, the nanovax, the vaccines, basically. Um, and, uh, um, but we, we do everything in-house, okay? So we have our own chips. So these are microchips. They are glass because if you use solvents, like organic solvents, glass doesn't, doesn't matter. They, they are very resistant. Okay, but we use small volumes. Uh, with uh, typically, you, you can produce small materials for 100 to uh, nanometers to up to micro uh, meters range. Uh, it's a very flexible um, uh, uh, kind of technique. You can use any kind of solvents. You can use any kind of materials, basically. Um, it's well, you don't need to use so much energy. You just need to to have a pump, obviously, um, and then you can produce. Emulsions, double emulsions, single emulsions, you can produce nanoparticles and so on. Um, core shell particles, I'll show you some examples. What you have to know, and this is very important when you are working with microfluidics, of course, microfluidics, you can also use it for, uh, for creating organ on a chip. So it's used also microfluidics. So what I'm going to show you here, obviously, is not organ on a chip. It's, it's for nanofabrication or microfabrication. But you could also use similar kind of channels for organ on a chip. And we are also doing that a lot in Groningen for example. So what you need to control are these parameters here. It's the, the concentration of what you put here. If you are using polymers, is the polymer. The flow rate, uh, the viscosity. So the viscosity is very important. Um, uh, the capillar number. So the capillar, you, you have here capillars. What we have here is capillars, actually. So we have a flow coming in, another flow coming in. They mix at the interface, and then you get the precipitation, for example. Okay. So you need to, uh, and the capillar size you can change. 
And something that we call Reynolds number. Reynolds number is actually uh, um, uh, something that is bit, um, a parameter that you control between the, the all of this, the flow rate and the viscosity, for example. Okay. So the, the, if you use, um, 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 well, I give you an example. So a, a low Reynolds number is that when you open the tap of the water at your home and you see a flow coming very slowly. That is the laminar flow, by the way. So, well done. Um, so, it has a very low Reynolds number. If we increase the Reynolds number, it's equivalent of you uh, put the, the, the top of your water, uh, of, uh, the water uh, you, you, you put it more, and what happens? The water goes everywhere. You know, it just starts to spill out. Uh, that is a, a, a higher Reynolds number. And actually, we use those two depending on what you want to produce. I will show you some examples. Uh, okay, so um, then we have, you can create droplets, so large droplets, small droplets. You can create uh, very precise jets like this, or then exactly what I mentioned, you can create what we call a micro vortices. Micro vortices is exactly this, this very random mixing in a chip, okay? This is extremely important. So from here to here, we are talking about 10 times more production. So here you can produce um, let's say milligrams. Here you, we can go up to kilograms. Okay, so that makes a big difference when you are producing uh, nanoparticles, for example. Okay, just by using that. Um, wait, I have a video that my student did a few years ago. Uh, does the sound work? Shall I put it from the computer, maybe? Right. Stop the share, share, and then share sound. Oh, great. And then here, perfect. Fantastic. Thank you so much. So let's see what my student has to tell you about microfluidics. Let's try again. Microfluidics is a sophisticated... Let's try from the beginning. He did this video himself. Microfluidics is a sophisticated technique with application in the pharmaceutical nanotechnology world and which has brought revolutionary impact on a wide range of therapeutic strategies. Such technique allows the manipulation of nanoliter volumes of immiscible carrier phases in microscale fluidic channels towards the synthesis of advanced drug delivery systems with high precision and sensitivity. For this purpose, glass capillaries can be manually assembled within minutes in a chemically compatible and user-friendly microfluidics platform with two injection components. The first one containing the nanoparticle forming substance in solution and the second being a non-solvent for the previous substance. Upon mixing a determined flow pattern, it is possible to obtain a colloidal suspension of nano or microparticles almost instantaneously. The success of microfluidics is due to the possibility of fabricating monodispersed drug carrier systems of various chemical compositions with tunable size, highly homogeneous and with a drug encapsulation efficiency of almost 100% allowing for the possibility of co-administering multiple drugs for synergistic benefits, for example, in cancer therapy, being therefore ideal for the preparation of advanced drug delivery systems. Great. So, Juan was my PhD student, and obviously, uh, as I mentioned, companies try to steal the student, not steal, but anyway, when he finished PhD, he's now working on the biggest uh, uh, pharmaceutical company in Finland, Orion Pharma. So, uh, uh, and uh, he was a master also on the, on the microfluidics. So what he was trying to say is that microfluidics can be understood as the Swiss, Swiss uh, uh, army knife. Uh, you can do a lot, these are emulsions, so a single emulsion containing nanoparti uh, microparticles inside. Or then down here, uh, so you, what you can see, so these are double emulsions, and what you don't see is that inside actually we have nanoparticles as well. And it's, if you look to these bubbles here or to these emulsions, 
what do you realize immediately? Sorry? Sorry? They are? The size are exactly the same, right? So this is one of the, it's very difficult to reproduce this if you do it in bulk. With microfluidics, you can see that they are actually the same size if you do it very, very properly. And then uh, if you introduce the parameters properly, so then you can, uh, you know, you can just use exactly the same parameters and the next researcher can also reproduce all this data. So it's not very operated dependent, it's more on the, the parameters dependent, okay? And basically what you need is pumps to pumps. We usually have Harvard, Harvard pumps, a microscope, and if you know how to do these chips, microchips, and that's all you need. Um, and we go from uh, um, a very expensive um, uh, commercial available microfluidics machines that they are very expensive actually, and the chips that you have to use different chips all the time uh, to a very, very cheap uh, uh, actually setup. This is uh, um, 10 times cheaper at least. Um, Ah, by the way, if you want to, to learn more, or, okay, let me go back, sorry. So if you, to, if you want to learn more about microfluidics, I also have a book on that. Uh, and of course, I can also provide you the, the PDF if you wish. So how does it work, basically? So uh, we do a lot of uh, dynamic simulations. So uh, uh, in order to, so we have capillaries where we have a solvent, uh, a co-solvent, and then a mixture here. And you, we can uh, simulate how the flow you need in order to produce different, different particles, actually. Um, so, uh, and as you can see here, here it's, it's like a laminar flow. And we move here, it's a very turbulent flow, okay? So, and this has an impact on the production of the nanoparticles, of course. Uh, so, just an example, PLGA nanoparticles produced with bulk, uh, Skytosa nanoparticles produced in bulk, uh, Dextran nanoparticles produced in bulk, and then you can see how it looks in microfluidics. When you look to the size distribution, the green is the microfluidics, and you can see the other one, so the narrow size distribution of the microfluidics. Um, and if you look to the, uh, to the drug encapsulation, so you can see here, just look at there, encapsulation efficiency, 90% with microfluidics uh, technology, okay? So you can get a lot more also there. Um, how it looks, so this is the laminar flow, so very low Reynolds number, 20, very high Reynolds number, and you can see here that you create a storm on a chip, okay? Why this is so important, you can see here you go from 45 grams per day of uh, nanoparticles to 242 grams per day of nanoparticles. And this is with a single chip. If you put more in parallel, then you, of course, you can increase more. Okay, let's move on. So I had a, a Dong Fei Liu was one of my uh, PhD students and then postdocs. He's now a full professor at uh, the China Pharmaceutical uh, um, University. Uh, and basically, he was crazy about uh, microfluidics. So he, 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 he did everything possible to develop a system that you can create, uh, well, whatever you can imagine for nanofabrication, basically. And what he, what he did, he created um, uh, also um, a drug nanocrystal. So basically, he created two uh, different uh, uh, steps of a chip in a single chip, uh, where we, we did um, microvortices here, so to precipitate the drug, and then uh, stabilize this drug nanocrystal with a, uh, a thin layer of a polymer. So we create a core shell structure on a microfluidic two-step. Uh, actually, we patent, patented this, and I will show you soon. But basically, what we use is sorafenib as a drug, and then acetylic dextran as the, um, as the stabilizer. What you see here is a nanocrystal of the drug, so the dark part is the nanocrystal, and the, the shell, so the thickness of the shell that we can control, actually, is actually the, the polymer, okay? So you have almost 100% of your particle is the drug. Okay, and this is, of course, has huge benefits because then your particle is almost 100% the, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the nanoparticle. And of course, we tested for the, the, the cell killing of, uh, for, uh, for, for cancer, uh, and we also checked how much you can use for, for that. And of course, uh, um, it's more efficient if you do it this way than if you use soraf sorafenib because it's a very hydrophobic drug molecule. But I'm not going to tell you that. So actually, the method is called super fast sequential nanoprecipitation, and this is what we do. We create a micro vortex follow for a laminar flow to do this. So in a single chip, we create two things. This is actually the first time that it was ever done um, and uh, um, 
and what you what you achieve is that uh, you can see also here by changing the Reynolds number you can also uh, change the, um, uh, the 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 different fabrication process uh, of these of these particles. Um, uh, why this is so important? I already told you. First of all, because you can encapsulate drugs inside of polymer uh, of a polymer uh, uh, shell, basically. Uh, and second of all, that's what I'm going to show next. I hope. Second of all, is that we were able to produce with a single chip almost one kilogram of nanoparticles in a single step. Okay. So uh, um, this is how powerful this technique can be if you want to extend to scaling up your your production. Okay, but of course you can do many other things. I go back to the to the, my student that was working with the buyer. So he also was trying to do the, the first st the study that I show. It was with the bulk, and this one here was was with microfluidics. So you can also replicate them much better using the the microfluidic nanoprecipitation. Again, you need to to check all the parameters. You I probably you cannot see it very well. I am I'm afraid. But anyway, we try uh, uh, different kind of solvents and different kind of uh, uh, purification process to see if that changes also the nano particles after the, the fabrication uh, that is very important and again if you look at here um, uh, the particles look much better than when they were doing in bulk but again some of the cases you can see they are not uh, as homogeneous as they used to be so it also depends on the polymers it also depends on the on the materials that you use uh, let me move forward this is too uh, small um, so recently, let me show it here. So recently, we also started to use RNA, of course, because everyone is using it as well. So what we started to do is microfluidic fabrication of this is a hybrid, so as a PLGA mix with a with a polymer, similar uh, with a lipid, sorry, similar lipid that was in the Moderna vaccines, uh, and loaded with RNA. And you can see here the narrow of the of the particles, so very small narrow sizes, about 150, and the size you can see it also from here. So they are they are hybrid particles, so it's a mixture of polymer particles and lipid particles. There are some advantages here. So in this case, uh, we wanted to study uh, or to use this platform uh, for for dual drug delivery. So we had uh, in this case uh, um, two drugs that we load, so Sirna and also a Budesonide, uh, uh, Budesonide because they are using for anti-inflammatory applications. We are very interested uh, on the tendon uh, um, for some reason. So for athletes, for example, uh, high athletes. So I have a big project in, in, in Europe. It's, it's a Marie Curie project, uh, ITN. So that uh, belonging to this project, 15 PhD students uh, all over the world can apply for these uh, uh, positions. But we are already in the middle. Uh, but basically, uh, the idea is that we tackle the uh, tendon inflammation. So if you, uh, it can be in animals for the competition or humans for the, uh, for the regeneration of, of the tendons, for example. So we are using this kind of technology. I don't know why the, the pictures look so bad. But uh, uh, anyway, we use, uh, as you can see, we, we, we use PLGA nanoparticles, lip nanoparticles, combination of these. And we also study the size and how do they, uh, the size is affected, the stability of this in, uh, uh, in media, in different media as well, uh, as well, of course, all the, the release. And this is done with microfluidics. So, of course, after you produce the particles, you have to test all these parameters. So this is very important. Cell toxicity, for some reason, I, I think you cannot even read it because at least I cannot. I don't know. Uh, but anyway, we tested the toxicity in uh, uh, human ten uh, tenocytes, for example, so primer cell lines that we do it. So this is another thing that it's important to do all the time. Uh, and then we, we also test the interactions with macrophage, murine macrophage and human macrophage to see how these particles interact and how do they go inside or not go inside of the macrophages by using confocal microscopy as well. So this is a very, very important. And also how they actually they go. So this you probably cannot see so well here, but it actually what it shows is the, the mechanisms of internalization inside of the macrophages, which is very important to understand when using such kind of nanoparticles.
in another study, it's very, very similar, but in this case, we use curcumin. So it's, again, a microfluidic production. We use de 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 dextran acetate. We also like a lot of dextran uh, uh, sugar. Uh, and we put curcumin inside. Curcumin can be used for many different things. Uh, and we use as a tannic acid as, uh, 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 as a, a kind of cross-linker or at least a stabilizer of, this, uh, of these materials. And then we also did exactly the same studies. Uh, so uh, we did the size evaluation and you can see here we can get about, uh, below uh, 300 nanometers. In this case, it's not important to be that large because they will be injected locally, for example. You see the particles over there, how do they look like under the microscope and so on. Um, and then you need to do all the tests, but I, I want to get to the next, um, to the next, uh, uh, present, uh, to the next uh, topic actually. So uh, you can also use, so this was with soft materials, but you can also use microfluidics with very large materials. So here we use uh, 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 diatomites. I think someone was working with, uh, with silica-based diatoms. So here we use also this. So diatoms can be extracted from the sea, for example. They are porous structures that you can load. So in this case, we load also uh, uh, some uh, anti-cancer molecules and we produce all the way exactly the same way with, the, with the, uh, a, a core made of these diatoms and then a shell that is a, a polymer to stabilize the, the material. And then again, we tested, uh, this was for oral delivery. So again, it's a different kind of formulation. But basically what you see here is that the drug doesn't come out or it comes below 20% in very low pH, but as we increase the pH, so the pH means when it goes to intestinal level, pH usually is much higher. And as you can see here, then the, the particle starts to degrade and we have a huge release of this. So it's a stepwise. So we can create this stepwise just by using this kind of core shell structures produced by microfluidics technology, for example. Shift. Uh, obviously, what you want also to check, uh, um, sorry, 40 minutes, okay, plenty of time, good, um, but I want to get some, uh, uh, some time for discussion as well. So, of course, what you want also to check uh, is that how this... Uh, these nanoparticles then uh, uh, go inside. So not only visualize that they are interacting with the cells, but also quantify how much they, they go inside. So we use here a technique that is flow cytometry. How many of you have used flow cytometry? Some of you have used, okay. So we also use a lot of flow cytometry, very good. In different cells, you can see. So these are uh, uh, cancer-derived intestinal cells. And you can see here, the more it shifts in this side, so the more you can get to the, to the, uh, to the cancer cells, internalization. So in these ones, you, we don't get. Actually, we didn't want to get to these ones. But in these cells, because actually uh, uh, our target moiety was meant for, for these cells, we can see a shift, so we can see an increase. And if you look to the... Um, Toxicity. So we test different uh, uh, different properties of the toxicity at uh, ten hours, six hours, twenty four hours, and so on. So we have to get to know uh, how much uh, um, we how much those we can use, but also over the time, are they toxic or non toxic? So this is what uh, it's not enough that you use only one time point. You need to use more than one time point, of course. Uh, and then again, as I mentioned, you can visualize them. So that was quantification, so this part is the quantification. This part is the qualitative analysis where you can see actually if they are on the surface, if they go inside, when they go inside, at what time they go inside, okay, of the cells. So this is all the evaluation. And because we wanted to, uh, uh, to check the, um, the inflammation at the intestinal level, so we, did, uh, we used a technique that is a scratching technique. So basically we, we culture the, the cells and then we make a scratch and then we use our formulations to see how fast this, the drugs act so that these cells, uh, th these levels start to come together. So uh, um, the faster it is means the, the, the better your formulation is reducing inflammation or in other words, is inducing proliferation, proliferation of the cells much faster, okay? So this is also very important. So everything that I showed it to you is on a nanoscale, but of course, if you want to use microfluidics for microparticles, it's even easier. Much, much simpler, much, much easier. Why? Because microfluidics, by definition, is a micro scale already, right? So uh, we also have used it for 
uh, uh, high drug loaded microsphere production. Uh, basically, uh, what you can produce is microspheres. I will show you. So this kind of microspheres that he showed he, that he has here that contain um, different drug molecules that you can use. So like these ones here. Uh, basically, and uh, uh, um, uh, the beautiful of that, of course, is because if you are working with microspheres, uh, uh, you can visualize them as well. So, uh, um, as you can see here, so we use this uh, TPEs is a chemical because when we are producing the microspheres, then we can see in this uh, in these channels how the part the particles are forming. So immediately you can observe if your fabrication pro process uh, uh, is is going well or not. If you are doing bulk, you only, only know it at the very end when you are analyzing. So in this case, you can also evaluate what's going on all the, uh, uh, along the process. This was also one of my postdocs that did this, um, uh, this kind of work. And then if you look to the beautiful microsphere, so at least if you can spot any difference in size, uh, I, I cannot. So they are very, very similar. But more importantly, uh, um, let's look to the, um, to the loading degrees. So we did it in the SLA dextrin and PLGA, different drug molecules. So all these uh, different molecules, they are very hydrophobic and they have different properties, okay? So if you look to the loading degree, you can see what happens here. So uh, to get a loading degree uh, uh, using a bulk technique uh, close to 100% is almost impossible. Um, I'm not talking about encapsulation efficiency. I'm talking about loading degree uh, percentage. And this is uh, um, only possible with, with a technique like microfluidics. So we can use it also to increase the loading content of, of the particles molecular uh, by weight. Of course, you can characterize then uh, the, the, your, your spheres. We do a lot of techniques. You can in, even visualize the crystals. So what we do is that uh, uh, we cut the microspheres in half, and then we can visualize what is inside of these microspheres. What is the state of the drugs inside? Are they in a morphous state? Are they in a crystalline state or nanocrystal state? And so on. So you can do a lot of that as well. Um, and of course, the, the, the release, that's what you want also to, to control when you are using this. So in this case, let me just go to our uh, in vivo studies. So in this case, we wanted to produce these microspheres for local injection on spinal cord injury. So what we did is that we broke the spinal cord of, uh, of animals, and then we local inject these microspheres with some of these drugs. And over the time, so you see here the broken spinal cord, and over the time, so this was about 28 days, we saw what was happening. And if you look very, very closely, you see that the, the spinal cord is getting regenerated. This is, of course, an effect, double effect of the drugs that are helping that, but also of the, of the polymers. There is a synergetic interaction between the polymers and the drugs that sp speed up the process uh, um, by using this kind of, uh, of approach. So you can also use it for different therapy, in this case, local injection. Uh, it could be something else. Um, so I already told you about diabetes. So we work quite many years also uh, on diabetes. Um, at some point, I also visited Novo, uh, Novo Nordisk. Uh, it's a big company in, in, in EU on, on insulin-based therapies. Um, and... Um, and basically, what we we try to do with microfluidics technology, we try to find a way to incorporate insulin or derivatives of insulin, in this case, um, exenatide, so that you could have it inside of these particles and deliver them to uh, to basically to type one or type two diabetic rats. Okay, so uh, um, I had another. Post a PhD student that work on on that for for many years uh, tried to develop um, a system that could incorporate this actually co-loading these two these two structures or these two molecules sorry and evaluate what happens in vivo. So again, we use microfluidics technology. We produce these beautiful particles with insulin and the other drug. Uh, again, the encapsulation efficiency was very very high. The loading degree. Depending on the drug polymer ratio, you could get up to 80%. And this is not a, a, a small drug molecule. These are very large drug molecules, okay? So we are now talking about proteins like insulin and uh, other molecules. So they are really large. Still, we were able to get about 80% of loading degree, which is really very, very high, actually. 
So of course you need to to uh, to understand uh, maybe. Uh, so what we did is that we tried to precisely control the ratios between the drugs, the polymers that you are using, the solvents that you are using. And it's not easy, even with microfluidics. So it's very tedious. But once you get to the optimization, then uh, you can get results like this. And if, uh, um, if you have a microfluidics technology and I give you the same parameters, you should be able to reproduce exactly the same results, okay? So this is the advantage. So what we did is we did a design analysis so uh, of the combination of uh, of the drugs, for example, and also uh, how do they? How about now? Better? Okay. Ah, okay. Thank you very much. So uh, in this case, you can predict where uh, what kind of combinations will give you the best. Uh, uh, the, the, the best particle containing the, 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 the amount of drugs that you desire, of course. So the idea is that, of course, if you, uh, um, if you are working with, uh, uh, with insulin, I already mentioned, so you want particles that give you uh, the, the longest possible release. So here now we are talking about prolonged release, okay? So you can see here that uh, uh, um, the cumulative release of insulin, so it took more than 20 days to get up to 100%. But of course, you need to be sure, so this is the, the release. This is the technique that we call, uh, that we use uh, in order to make sure that when the protein is encapsulated inside of the microspheres, it's still uh, uh, intact, okay? Because if it's not, if the structure change and so on, then of course it's not more uh, any more effective. So this is what what we use as well, and to verify after the release, after the encapsulation, and after the release that the insulin, for example, was still fine. And you can do this then um, uh, do the testing in vivo. So we do the administration uh, subcutaneously, for example, and then we we look into the. The, the plasma insulin levels, is you can see here, with this, the insulin solution, this drops very fast. With our, with our uh, uh, particles uh, loaded with insulin, you can prolong at least still up to 12 days, which is quite nice. Of course, what you want is even more. Uh, but that's, that was already a good achievement. Um, and, uh, and again, when you look to the, uh, uh, the blood glucose levels as well here, so you can see the insulin doesn't, uh, insulin solution, basically it's not very efficient actually, as expected, why? Because it degrades very fast anyway. So with our, uh, uh, with our uh, uh, system, you can see that the, 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 the black sugar actually drops and only after 80 days, it goes again, again back. So you get the benefit there as well. So you have an advantage by using this kind of technology. Uh, uh, and that's why it's very important. Um, uh, you can, of course, it, comes, it becomes more complex when you load two of these large molecules into the system. And as you can see here, even by doing so, we still were able to prolong the release up to um, more than 20 days. And again, you have to look that they still behave the same. Ever, nothing changed in these molecules. In this case, uh, it was very similar. And we got very very similar uh, uh, results when we compare both drugs. So we, uh, in terms of the plasma insulin levels and also in terms of the, um, on the glucose levels, I'm not showing everything to you, but as you can see, so we still got a, a positive result. So it, it means that your molecules that were, um, uh, uh, macromolecules that were loaded inside of this system, they are still very, very efficient. So to summarize, um, what I wanted to tell you from the, the second part, uh, and I have then some, uh, um, some kind of exercise that we can do uh, um, afterwards, um, is that the microfluid technology has become more and more interesting for many reasons, especially for pharmaceutical applications. Uh, and the reasons are here because you can control the size, the structure and composition. You can produce different single emotions, double emotions, multiple emotions, micro and nanoparticles, for example, uh, just by simply ch uh, 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 changing the, the, the flow of, or the flow properties of your microfluidics. So, uh, by drop, drop base to uh, nanoprecipitation, you name it. But more important is that because this is becoming more interesting for an industrial uh, production point of view, okay? 
Uh, why? Because you have a continuous production uh, system. So it allows you to go from uh, grams to kilograms, for example. Uh, it's uh, industrial scaly production that we are talking about here. Uh, the methods that we use, well, they, you don't need to, to input so much energy or they are not so costly. The only cost that it becomes is from the drugs that you are using. Of course, if they are expensive, then the final product will be expensive. But the method, the method itself is very cheap. Um, and then, of course, what we want is that to minimize the or even eliminate the batch to batch variations. OK, so this is very important. And now before the questions, uh, unless you have some burning questions right now, but I would like still to show you something before. Let me see if this works. So now I would like to. Um, to do another exercise with you, because I already had similar idea as uh, Professor Prashant did yesterday. So I would like to do the same, but for that I need to find now the presentation. Just give me one second. Uh, uh, uh. Yes. So you will need to go again to your mobile phones. I hope that's not a problem. And um, let me try to share uh, here. Let's see. So again, it's, it's a small game. Um, it's different than yesterday. It's called Cahot. It's made in Italy, but ne ne never mind. Um, so if you go there and introduce that, so if you go to, it's, can you see it from there? Cahot.it. And if you put this pin, then it's going to, to, uh, um, to show a similar thing than yesterday. And... Um, I actually have a prize for the three winners. Sorry? <laughs> you, 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 you can, you can log in. So I have two of these squeezes. They are very short, not, not as long as Prashant's squeezes. They are very short, so just a few questions. Um, and they are about two of the... Um, the, the two parts that I have, one is about the nanomedicines and the other is going to be about the microfluidics. Uh, I noticed that I have skipped some of the slides, so I'm not 100% sure that you will, um, you will be able to, uh, um, to answer to all the questions, but just give it a try. Anyway, it's for fun. Oh, is it? Oh, mamma mia, just a second. Oh, I hope it didn't kill my... Just a second, let me try again. <clears throat> It used to allow more than uh, um, oh, that would have been very okay, by the way, guys, there is water outside in the filter because the weather is very hot, so pueden ir allá afuera con su botella o con algo y rellenarlo hay un filtro aquí en el pasillo frente al café. Okay, el clima es muy cálido aquí. Mm. I think there is a limitation now by the the, um, the program. So, <clears throat> if you can work in teams, that would be great. It's okay. So let's let's try again. So you will have to work in teams. Because I'm afraid that I I'm, I don't have access to the full version.
let me see. Yeah, it, it doesn't allow more than 10, I guess, more than 20, unfortunately. So, um, yeah, if you can work in teams, like by rows or so, that would be great. Let's give it a try. <clears throat> I think you, you were able to load like 20, wasn't so? Yeah? Yeah, so that's the limit, sorry. So if you try to work by teams. Ah, you cannot see it, of course. Because I'm not sharing it. Let's try again. I don't they have the whole limit you have to pay in order to get that. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't notice because it usually used to be like you have endless before. Are you working teams as a team, I hope? Yes? So let's let's start. So you will see the questions there. By the way, it can be multiple choices, so not only one choice. Oh, okay. It starts with the last one, but it doesn't matter. It's microfluidics now. Oh. Bigger? This one, maybe. This one? Yeah. Um, Is it better now? I didn't say this was easy, right? OK. So the parameters, uh, you have to read very, 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 um, very careful the questions, OK? Because they have some tricks sometimes. I do this on purpose for the students. So be sure that you are reading them very, very carefully. So let's go to the next. So <laughs> don't worry, it's going to get better. I told you about the Reynolds number and the ratio about that. So I hope you still remember. There was one person that got it right. Well done to the person that made it. Ah, okay. So, <clears throat> so I told you that sometimes to stabilize, you need to do some things to the, the particles as well. So, Wildly guess, because I think it, two persons, very good. Six, sorry, yes, very good. It's getting better. Now we have the screen full. There are pictures, let's see, can you see it? I didn't tell you how, how this was done, sorry but maybe you can guess. Great. Some of you got it. Well done. 
So depending on the device, we can have different flows and different kind of structures. <clears throat> Let's see if you can guess this one as well. I told many times this one, I hope that we... Okay, good. <clears throat> Very good, so six of you we're very on spot, good. Let's go to the next. I already, I, I mentioned this also a few times in my talk. Very good. Five of you were very on spot as well. Well done. The pictures can be self-evident, but let's see. <clears throat> Shouldn't be too difficult, I guess. Very good. You got it. We have a change in the... So which one of these statements is true? Very good. Some of you managed to get it correct, the double emotions, even though we didn't speak so much about that today. Two more to go. This one you have to know because I just told it. From all of these, actually, that one was the, the, the one, good. Eight of you got it right. And that's the last one from this part. And then I have another one. <clears throat> so let's see. I did? Okay, yes, good. Oh, thank you very much for the one that did. Okay, so that was it. So let's see what happens here. Who is Anna S? Come here. Lance Biot, Biot who is? And, 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 and game, you, all the groups? So is the other one? Good. Uh, give them a round of applause. They managed to. By the way, any of you works with microfluidics? Ah, okay. So you are the you were the winner, the second one. So you are the winner. Wow, fantastic. Yes, let's take a picture. Wonderful. I have something to you later, so come to me after that, because we, we still have one more to go. Don't forget it. 
So, I have another one from the... Um, Give me a second. So from the nanomedicine side, I will also like to um, to do one, uh, not this one. Just a second. This one. So let's try to do the same, but now about the nanomedicines, okay? So if you do the same, if you log in, and um, unfortunately you have to work again in pairs or in, in teams somehow. So the fastest ones will get to there. And that was it, sorry for that. If you have a computer, I oh, know it doesn't work anyway. So now it's about nanomedicines, it's about the first part that I told you. So let's see if you uh, still remember and look to the questions, read very careful. Sorry. Industrial applications is very important here when you talk to... Very good. Let's see, what is not a problem? What do you think is not a problem? That can be my opinion, what is a problem? Might be different than yours, let's see. So carrying different drugs is not a problem. All the others are actually a big problem. Which is not an advantage, okay? So there, it's not big advantages actually, because other things can do as well. So what do you think it's not considered much when designing nanomedicines? I told you many things what you should consider. Yeah, so that's not something that you would consider from the very beginning, but the other things, yes. Of course, depending on the case, you might also consider it, of course. <laughs> so monotherapy means using a single drug, uh, Code delivery means using more than one drug, so this is what it means. And actually, no danger drug interactions would be one of the things to consider there. We have very good um, responses there. So this is about oral drug delivery. So some of you are, or, or, are working on oral drug delivery. So let's see. So 
So increasing the hydrophobicity of the drugs is important here, of course, because they are usually poorly water soluble. This is a question, it's more about literature, if you, if you have any idea. So if you think about, about uh, the application of, of which one you think that is the most... Uh... I hope you're, almost all of you answer orally. But if you can do a, form a formulation orally, that's what the pharmaceutical industry will take it <clears throat> because it's easier also to formulate. So sometimes I said you use for targeting peptides, for example, or other ligands. So uh, let's see uh, what is the great advantage of using such things compared with just the particles themselves. <clears throat> and some of those are there. Hmm, I'm not sure if I showed the picture of this, but let's see. Oh, I did. <clears throat> Try to identify what mechanisms of uh, I mix them a little bit around. Great. Yes. So it was active, uh, triggered, and then passive. Good. You still remember? That's great. The CR is in, in the lead. I think I mentioned this few times as well. So let's see if you still remember. <laughs> this is... <laughs> Often happens, yes, the passive target has that, that possibility as well. Let's see the active targeting now, if you remember. Great, you are all on the right track. So a few more to go and then we are ready. <coughs> now the drawback. <coughs> what is one of the major problems on nanomedicines in cancer? Yes, it's still the lower tumor accumulation, unfortunately. So that's the, big, the biggest problem, actually, of all. CR still on the lead. Ah, let's see if you can guess what kind of particles we have there. Liposome, polymerosome, porous nanoparticle, and a polymeric micelle. Yes. Anyway, some of you managed to identify that correctly. CR is still on the lead. can also answer to that one if you wish. 
Not sure if it's ready. It's the correct. Good. Most of you did um, manage there as well. Wow. Three more to go. So this is intravenous administration. Okay. IV means intravenous administration. <clears throat> yes, actually, that is still the one. Let me go next. Two more to go. This is a preclinical evaluation, what it takes into account. They were all correct, so it doesn't matter what you answer. So they were all correct, actually. So. You all got points, but not the full points if you don't select more than one. Okay, uh, the last one. This is the definition of nanomedicines actually. And this is you, if you are working in the field, you really have to know the definition of nanomedicine. This is what nanomedicine actually means. I had it in one of my first slides, but I didn't read it to you. Yes, so nanomedicine is defined as to improve all biological systems based on monitoring, management, repair, protection, and using of nanostructures. That's actually the definition of nanomedicine, okay? Well then, for the, the 10 that manage. So, can I call to the podium Christian? Please, Marco, and the number one, the CR. Who is the CR? You are? Christian, you? Marco, wow, well done. Congratulations. Yeah, well done. And who are the CR? What is CR stands for? All of them. Well then, you got the big prize, come here. <laughs> Great. All right, so a round of applause also for them. Thank you very much. That was it. Um, I'm happy to answer questions now. I don't know how much time we have, or if we have time. The 10 Some minutes, time. let's say. So, or comments also, question comments. Yeah. Yes, uh, very, very interesting, Helder. Diatome size that you said that you were putting in the microfluids, what's the typical size, uh, for example? Diatome, we were using, they are actually very large, they are between 200 and 300. Mm -hmm. yeah. Nanometers, okay, so it's big. And for the insulin ones, I, I didn't understand, for example, when you show the plot of the release, you say it can be released at 100% about 20 days, but when you show the plasma uh, insulin content, then the maximum level was about eight days. So I'm not sure why so, this difference. Yeah, it's very different because in one case, and that's the reason that I said that we need to always to, that's a very good question, you need always to evaluate the in vitro and the in vivo uh, application. And and the, the what we are replicating there was the in vitro, and the in vitro we can see that you can do it over uh, 20, but when you go to in vivo, the maximum that we got was about 12. So that shows how different these things are. And 
Possibly, if you go to an, a, a different animal models, maybe some different results you have. So uh, you need to be very, very careful when you analyze this data because if I go to a pharmaceutical company and show that, oh, I can increase to 20 days, they will be astonished. But then the in vivo actually show that it's much, much lesser than that. So it is very important to, uh, to always have your in vivo and vitro, in vitro data uh, together because sometimes what you reproduce in vitro is not exactly the same what you are going to expect in vivo. As it showed here, even 12 days is already good, a good fit, but uh, uh, it's, it, it, we would need more. Yeah, so that's that's the, the discrepancy between in vitro and in vivo testing. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Yep. Yes, please. Thank you for your talk. Um, my question is the different targets of, for a nanoparticle could be in different cells or they have to be in the same. So do you mean if the different uh, um, if the cells express the same receptors or no? If the um, a nanoparticle that has different targets. Yes. These targets could be in the in different cells, or uh, the same particle but target two different cells. Yes. So that's possible. So if you have a, a particle with the specific targets to different cells, you can do that. So actually, we did. I didn't show the data that the one that I I scroll very fast. We did exactly that. So we modify the particle with two different peptides, one to target macrophages and one to target the cardiomyocytes. But um, if you want to to applicate for at the same time, how how are you sure that the um, the nanoparticle um, could function? For the, for the two cells? Well, you can, because as I mentioned, you can do a lot of uh, uh, analysis in order to really evaluate where the particles are going. So you most likely, if you're targeting are, are, are specific for the different cells, you will expect that in one of the cells you have par the, the, some particles and the other of this. So if the, if the targets are different enough, so then they should not target to the same, to the same uh, receptor, right? So if the cells have different receptors for your targets, then you would expect that the nanoparticles to, to go to that cell, but not go to the other one, but they have to be very different enough. Actually, yesterday when I was talking about this uh, eat me, don't eat me effect, it was exactly that kind of uh, uh, thing that we did. We modified the surface with two different targets so that two different cells, they visualize differently. So in one case, it visualized the, the particle, but in the, in the other case, it didn't. So this is how, how it works, but it has to be extremely spe specific. So, but it's possible to do. So it goes to one cell, but it doesn't go to the other. And then when it sees the one that it, you want, it goes to that one, but not to the other. So, but as I mentioned, it's not an easy thing. You have to have very specific targets and the receptors have to be specific enough for your target. Thank and it's you. possible to have multiple targets on the surface. Was there someone else? Oh, yeah. Um, hi, thank you. In one of the slides, you mentioned about the release of the drug. Uh, before applying in the in vivo models, did you have any other way to quantify how much of the nanoparticles release the drug, or did you just put it on the in vivo model to quantify how much of the drug was released? Uh, so, you, yeah, before going to in vivo, the only way that you have to do it is using these in vitro models, in vitro assays that, that I showed. So you don't have any other way out to, to evaluate that, unfortunately. So you have to do these uh, release tests of the drugs inside of the, of the particles, and that gives you an idea uh, when you move to in, to in vivo. But otherwise, it's, uh, it's not, it, um, at least that I know, there is no other way that you can evaluate that basically. Uh, or do you have any ideas how to do that or? Um, no, um, I'm trying to evaluate the release of uh, another uh, drug. Yes. But I'm kind of lost on the way to quantify that. 
and I was kind of so it, it depends. It. You can use different things for quantification. So uh, you can use an ELISA assay if your drug can be detected antibodies, for example, peptides. Um, you can use HPLC. So most of the times we use HPLC. So these are the techniques. Uh, but there is no other way. Uh, or if you are using proteins, you can use BSA uh, analysis, for example. So, but there is no other way that you can evaluate before you go to to in vivo. In vivo, you you are seeing on a very macroscopic level, and in vitro you can see on a, on an individual level, basically. Uh, but uh, yeah, using the normal release assays are, are the the uh, the way to evaluate. If if your system is releasing faster or slower, so there is no other 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 uh, ways how you can say what happens to your drug after the um, after you load them in the in the particles. Unfortunately, Thank yes. You. If you have a fluorescence um, um, drug, then you can also use fluorescence uh, uh, analysis, for example. So. Hi, thank you. Hi. Um, my question is, when when you calculate the amount of drug that you entrapped in your nanoparticulated system, you, well, um, you have a like a, a reference, but when you try to, have you tried to calculate the amount of polymer left in the surface of your nanoparticle? Or how, or how can you calculate the polymer that's left in the surface? So we, we calculate per weight of, of, the par, of the total particles, typically. Mm -hmm. So you have, you have one gram of particles, uh, and then you calculate the, the drugs that are inside of that one gram of particles. But you are not able, it's, it's at least that I know, uh, <clears throat> To, and if you know, please tell me uh, <laughs> how you could calculate the amount of polymer that is around a single particle that is extremely difficult. Uh, uh, what you could do, you could dissolve, degrade the particle, and then try to quantify by mass, mass spec, for example. But it's very tedious kind of process. So we usually what we do is that we freeze dry these particles, and then we weigh the the the, the, the well the, the weight of the of the particles, and then we calculate according to that but it is possible to mistake that uh that amount of polymer because you have also if if you do only polymeric nanoparticles you may have a polymeric core or matrix and you yeah may yeah. mistake it with that yes absolutely so you there is always a, a error, error associated with that because you cannot precisely tell um the amount that that's for sure but it's 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 not um um in such a way that we'll change so much different your 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 results but otherwise yeah it's it's not so easy to do that kind of a quantification with polymeric nanoparticles thank you welcome my question is if you put the drugs in the dispersed space in the formation of the microparticles? It depends on the nanoparticles. So, uh, uh, depends. but it depends on the kind of nanoparticles that you want to produce. Uh, but, uh, but yes, typically you put in the dispersion phase, yes. Yes, okay. the drugs. Yeah. Welcome. Okay, well, let's keep uh, applause to yeah. Dr. Thank you very Kander. much. Thank you. And uh, so now we have the coffee break and remind that in 15 minutes we have to be back for another fantastic talk. Thank you. And the winners, if you want to collect your prize, come to me. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Can we give the, the prize to Yes, you? probably I will give and then I can discuss it later. Yes, fine. Is it smaller? No, it's not a smaller ah, shape.
Okay, well, let's start uh, with this second lecture of the session uh, today. So this is going to be very related to, or I guess, uh, to what Brandon uh, talked in the morning about bacteria, bacterial biofilms. So but remember, this is a lecture, so uh, you can ask in any time. So let's keep it like, you know, for that aim to learn, to interact. So uh, you know already Brandon from the morning, so I'm not going to introduce again. But well, let's keep an applause to Brandon to start. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I would like it. it. It is a lecture. So please ask questions throughout. If you don't understand anything, there's plenty of time. I only have 93 slides <laughs> for two hours. Plenty of time to discuss things. I do realize that you are chemists and physicists, and I'm a biologist. So the purpose of this talk is so that I can train you how to talk to biologists. So when you need your particle tested, you can tell them exactly what you need and you will get exactly what you want. <laughs> That's the purpose of this time of talk. <clears throat> um, unfortunately for that, I do have to go into some theory for you in biology. <laughs> <clears throat> so basically, I only have one history slide, mandatory for us to do this because the first person who discovered Bacteria under a microscope was a Dutch scientist. So being from a Dutch university, this is a mandatory slide for us in microbiology. I'm not very fluent in Dutch, so I'm not even gonna try and pronounce it. <laughs> but for those who are uh, familiar with him, uh, but it took three centuries later before biofilms was even discovered. So they identified microbiology and the bacteria in the 17th century but it took 300 years or a little bit more than that before the first biofilms were even decided to be described. But yet in human infections, we're talking about over 60% and sometimes in literature, it could be over 80% of all bacteria infections are related to biofilms. So when you are trying to treat a bacterial infection with your nanoparticles, most likely you should be working with biofilm experiments. You will not be able to translate your nanoparticle technology if you only test against planktonic or bacteria in suspension. So this is the reason why I have this slide here. <clears throat> if you wanna try and describe a biofilm, there are three critical components within the definition. The first is that it's a community of bacteria cells. If you don't have a community of cells, you do not have a biofilm. They also have to be associated with the surface. If they're not associated with the surface, you may have a community of, bio, uh, of cells, but you do not have a biofilm. The third component, and probably the most tricky one for trying to treat a biofilm, is that they are uh, in basically self-contained in a matrix of extracellular polymeric materials or substances. They are not exopolysaccharides. Please chemists do not come to biologists and label them as exopolysaccharides. They contain DNA, proteins, <laughs> a lot of other materials. Yes, they do contain polysaccharides, but that's not just polysaccharides. That's not what EPS is. <laughs> I know I came from chemistry. I called it that to begin with. <laughs> I was quickly corrected. <clears throat> so again, not only do you have these particular components, but you also may have non-cellular material also found within the matrix of the biofilm. You may have debris from your nanoparticles that get absorbed into the matrix of a biofilm and used for protection. And we'll get into this one a little bit. I have a couple of slides on this, but biofilm bacteria are distinctly different than those in, in the planktonic. The most common theme that you should know about is that bacteria in biofilm are typically 1000 times more resistant to antibiotics than their planktonic counterparts. That's an average, doesn't always happen that way, 
but on average, they're about 1,000 times more resistant. Now, you'll see that this definition was from 2002. Microbiologists have updated this definition, but it still contains, uh, so uh, this last part, it goes into the next part anyway, so I'll go to the next slide. We've updated the definition to what is an actual surface. Typically, when you think of a surface, you think of a hard material, say the floor, your chair, the door, something that is hard. You can also have living organisms as your surface. A bacteria can attach to a cell. <laughs> a bacteria can attach to another bacteria. In this particular case, you can form aggregates of cells that form EPS and uh, would be associated with each other in this particular case uh, up here. And now you have a new definition of biofilm. <clears throat> and this is typically what's seen if you let a growth culture of bacteria go too long in a test tube. <laughs> they won't be necessarily attached to the test tube, but they will act like a biofilm because they are so closely related to one another and forming these matrices. And this was updated in 2016. And again, the aggregate counts for the fact that it could be multi-layered biofilms, not just single two cells that are in contact with each other. You need more than two cells to create this term aggregate. And that's how we are able to distinguish between cells that are just neighboring each other and biofilms that are being formed without a hard surface. So why biofilms? Can anybody think of a reason why bacteria may want to form a biofilm? <laughs> yes, in the back. Protection. You absolutely nailed what I'm going to go into this particular slide. <laughs> so basically we have the bacteria, they form communities and when you get a large community, there's not a lot of EPS in this particular picture here, but there is a little bit of cross-linking between the bacteria, so you have a biofilm. For those that are uninitiated, you can think about it through your own personal safety. If you were to walk out on the street in the middle of the night, probably not the safest thing you could do. You go with a group of friends, probably a little safer. You go with a community, your neighborhood, go to a party, probably pretty safe, same idea. <laughs> the more bacteria you have in the biofilm, the more diversity you have, the safer you have for the entire community, maybe not for a single individual, but the community as an overall is safer. <clears throat> the stages of biofilm formation, you may see it as four, you may see it as five, you may see it as six. They all contain the same steps, just depending on how the, the scientist or researcher wants to group it together. The first, we've heard about a lot, protein absorption, the formation of a conditioning film. I classify this as a pre-stage, but it is an important stage in biofilm formation because usually bacteria will never see the surface that you're trying to actually uh, protect them against. The first thing that happens is that there's a protein layer that will form on your nanoparticle, your nanotechnology, your nanomedicine, and then the bacteria will then attach to that. You have initial adhesion, you have uh, basically irreversible or anchoring adhesion, you have EPS formation. If you end up to see four steps, these two are typically combined because they happen simultaneously. <clears throat> then you have growth, maturization, and you also get dispersion. There is a natural dispersion step to repeat the cycle. If biofilms end up to be too concentrated to the limited amount of nutrients in their area, they will then disperse their cells and try and find a new location to colonize. And this is how you get the spreading disease and that's typically where you end up getting the symptoms because you get an overpopulation. <clears throat> so I mentioned that the EPS matrix is more than just polysaccharides. 
It's responsible for the architecture, stability of the biofilm. It creates pores and channels for waste and nutrient movements. It forms the space between the cells uh, and also basically formulates the skin of the biofilm. Now it doesn't form skin like we have it as far as individual cells, but it does form a protective barrier with uh, hydrophobicity and hydrophilicity uh, barriers. So it maintains the osmotic pressure within the biofilm. <clears throat> and I don't expect you guys to memorize this table or anything else like that, but I have this table up here and several others within my presentation to show you the importance of certain things. If you ever wanted to go to this, I have the references here. So if you're interested, you could then grab that and go to that table and find out a little bit more. The students, on the other hand, that take the course have to memorize a little bit more than you do. <laughs> so here's some pictures of the EPS. And again, so we have it within the slime. The slime goes here. We have DNA, proteins, your polysaccharides. Within the polysaccharides, you have a little bit more interaction. And then you have this nice little x-ray crystallograph where you can see that the EPS is attached to the, uh, this little chain here of the surface. <clears throat> so you can get more into more detail uh, depending on how you are, are looking for. But you can see that this is a very, very dense structure. And that's what, why it's able to form the architecture of the biofilm. <clears throat> so within the EPS matrix, water is by far the most uh, abundant character, uh, component. Over 90% of it, 97% is water. And within the EPS, you're probably looking at about 80% of the biofilm is also within the EPS by mass. <laughs> so, if you were trying to do an imaging contrast in a water-soluble solution, <laughs> you're going to have a hard time trying to find the EPS <laughs> because there's not that much contrast between the EPS and what you're trying to do. The confocal laser scanning microscopy has that issue. It does not find water. <clears throat> so if you're trying to do some imaging, the spatial arrangements give rise to nutrients and gases gradients. Uh, again, this part is more text, uh, but I do have pictures on the next slide to try and uh, appropriate this. So you can get aerobic and anaerobic. Has anybody not heard those terms before? No, we're good with those terms, good. <laughs> Better than some of the chemists I know. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> but moreover, the sense of structure is not rigid, again, Biofilms are very dynamic in nature. They will change to their environment, which is why my, my research line, again, is bacterial adaptivity. We're looking at biofilms and how they react to their environment, the stresses that they see, whether it be physical, chemical, or other stresses that may, they might feel, nutrient limitations, they will adapt to survive. So here's a picture of both the oxygen gradient, the nutrient gradient, pH, and there's something here called a quorum sensing uh, gradient, where basically there's a trigger. As soon as there's a most signaling and receptor interaction, you will end up getting a, a new effect of your uh, bacteria within the biofilm. If there's not enough connection between the signal and receptor, so you may have enough signal, but not enough receptor, you will not actually get a response from the quorum setting mechanism. <clears throat> and cells within a biofilm also like to communicate. We like to communicate when we're out having a beer. Bacteria do as well, but they don't usually drink. <laughs> so they can talk again through direct communication here, but also whatever they see, uh, within the nutrient gradients, they can share. If there is a cytotoxin that one cell sees, pops open the cell membrane, that DNA then gets put into the extracellular matrix of the biofilm, and it sees and encodes through horizontal gene transfer and protects other bacteria. So when you're delivering your drug to a biofilm, you need to make sure you kill everything. 
Otherwise, the next time you try and treat it with your drug, bacteria are likely going to be resistant. <clears throat> also, you can have competition. How many of you here are familiar with the term probiotic? Usually with yogurts or milks, or, <laughs> those are the common ones for the gut. It took us a while, but we finally got you to eat bacteria. <laughs> But basically what they do is they try and compete with your, uh, the pathogenic bacteria or the disease-causing bacteria and maintain your basic overall equilibrium of your system or microbiome, and that's what keeps you healthy. Anytime your balance is off, that's where you're going to end up getting symptoms and you're going to feel uncomfortable. <clears throat> so... We talked about how bacteria basically attach to the surface and that's the starting of biofilms. We have things that you can do to prevent attachment of bacteria to your particles, your devices, implants. This particular slide is more for implant materials, but the effects of the substratum. So basically any type, whatever your material is, that is the substratum. So if you change your physical properties, mechanical properties of your substratum, you will influence the attachment. If you change the conditioning film that goes onto the substratum, you will also change the attachment properties. <clears throat> if you change the hydrodynamics of the medium that you're in, make it more viscous, you're going to end up changing how bacteria may attach to your surface. <clears throat> The characteristics of the medium, is it nutrient rich? Is it nutrient poor? Also will have an impact of what's surrounding the bacteria. We'll get a little bit into that later. <clears throat> Various properties of the cell surface, I covered a little bit in that, my morning lecture on that. And then uh, Donlin, uh, although this is September, 2002, still one of the better reviews about interactions between uh, surfaces and biofilms. Uh, basically, again, there's going to be a lot of text here, but again, you're looking at surface roughness. Typically, if you increase surface roughness, you are going to increase bacterial attachment. Now, I say typically because there's always exceptions to the rules, especially with bacteria. Um, however, <clears throat> how this works is that Shear forces get diminished as you're going through uh, closer to the surface. And there's also more surface area for the bacteria to actually see your surface if it's rough. Uh, however, bacteria typically are about one micron in diameter, depending on if it's a coccoid or a bacillus, but roughly about one micron. So if you were to make uh, one and a half or 1.2 micron wells, well, then the bacteria could be stuck in those particular wells and you're not gonna be able to get them out. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so you do need to be careful about how much roughness you do actually make. <laughs> Otherwise you can make uh, very nice uh, living habitats for them and uh, <laughs> very difficult to remove because they'll be stuck on both sides. <clears throat> I don't have a picture to draw over here, but <laughs> you can imagine uh, a valley and the bacteria stuck between them. <clears throat> And again, the physical chemical properties of the surface have a strong influence. A couple of our, our talks have talked about the protein or conditioning surface. It does have an impact, but it doesn't completely mask the properties of the, the substratum underneath. So if you're using titanium versus steel and you have the same conditioning film, the conditioning film is not going to override all of the differences between titanium and steel. <clears throat> And of course, there's an overlap here, but uh, due to the citations, I thought the citation would be more important for you. Um, but again, also most investigators find that they, they attach more rapidly to hydrophobic nonpolar surfaces such as Teflon. However, when you're cooking, you think that's the opposite. <laughs> so again, it depends on what type of bacteria you're looking for. Uh, in the oral cavity, hydrophobics actually do not tend to have bacteria attached to them. And thankfully we're far beyond lunch because I have some pretty interesting pictures coming up. 
but this is a conditioning film. Hopefully all of you have visited the dentist at least once and have gotten a professional clean. <laughs> Hopefully. What do you do? How does it feel when you run your tongue over your, your teeth immediately afterwards? <laughs> Pretty clean, right? The moment you take your first swallow, your teeth are no longer clean. <laughs> you will have a conditioning film on your teeth immediately after you swallow. <laughs> the saliva in your system is going to then cover your teeth. This is not a bad thing. This is good. This is a protective coating for your enamel. If you were to drink a cup of coffee without this protective cover, you would lose half of your teeth. The acidity from the coffee would dissolve the hydro, uh, hydroxy appetite in your dentin and you would have no teeth. <laughs> this is also the reason why they tell you to wait after you do treatments, whether, you know, wait after you brush your teeth, wait after you come home from the dentist before you eat or drink anything. It's not because they want to make you suffer. <laughs> it's because they want you to be protected before you end up coming back and make sure you have a conditioning film on your teeth. <clears throat> Here we have, for the chemists, <laughs> smooth and rough LPS. And my question to the audience is, what do you see as the difference between smooth and rough LPS? Now, the students that I get in Kronigan are typically not direct chemists, so they struggle with this one, but I'm hoping we can see an answer to this. So, Yep, exactly. So in the rough LPS, you get this little conformational change that is not able to conform from a, a linear perspective. So it, it has that, that conformational change and that's what makes it rough. You have that little speed bump along the way. <clears throat> there might be some other functional groups somewhere in here that might be different, but <laughs> what really makes it rough is that, that conformational loop here where it overlaps and prevents the conformational rotation. <clears throat> We've had some people talk about flow experiments, whether it be microfluidics, parallel plate flow chambers. Basically, we're looking at laminar flow, turbulent flow, um, and you have your surface of your object. Now, this is ideal. Again, the moment you interact with a biological system and you insert proteins into your system, those proteins form a conditioning film, you no longer have laminar flow. At the base of that, you're going to have the flow go over those proteins. It's still gonna be close to laminar flow, but it's not going to be laminar flow. Same is true when the first bacteria decides to attach to your surface. Now you're going to get turbulent flow around that one. And you're going to create individual parts that are unsteady and uneven throughout your flow system. So you may start with laminar flow, but towards the base of your surface, you are not going to get there. This is beeping, so is this the battery? Anyone? <laughs> okay, I'll just keep going. <laughs> <clears throat> so we also talked about the, uh, the, the properties of the, the medium. If you change the ionic strength, <clears throat> if you change the ionic strength of your particular uh, solvent or, or media solution, you change what's known as the hydrodynamic radius <clears throat> of both the surface and the bacteria. So if you have a very, very weak ionic strength, you have a very large uh, hydrodynamic radius for both your surface and your particle or bacteria as the case may be. Because of this, both the surface and the particle are not going to have a good chance to see each other. <laughs> They're going to be further, farther separated due to the hydro hydrodynamic radius. It's going to be difficult for the particle to see the surface. If you start to increase you're shrinking the hydrodynamic radius. You now have a higher chance that your particle or slash bacteria is going to then see the surface and have the ability to attach. 
So when you're thinking about your experiments, think about the ionic concentrations. If it's going through the bloodstream, you're going to have a lot of proteins. You're going to have a lot of salt concentration in there, 0 0.9. And you're going to have to think about your radius and whether or not it's going to attach or not. <clears throat> More importantly, for nanoparticles, under those conditions with proteins, are they going to aggregate? <laughs> And basically, this table summarizes everything from the Donlin review from the point that I introduced Donlin up until this point. So if you take a picture of this one, you have covered everything from the previous slides. <laughs> Make it easy on you. Uh, but this covers basically everything from that review about what is important and how you're interacting with bacteria, cell attachment, and biofilm formation. And I'll wait for the pictures to take. <laughs> <laughs> good. <clears throat> nope, one more. <laughs> nah, we're good. We're good. Yep. Another one in the back. <laughs> and also, if you wanted to go a little bit more again, this is the review here. So. <clears throat> and the, the actual citation there. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so, again, uh, I talked a little bit this morning about the initial adhesion of bacteria and how it gets impacted. When you talk about bacterial adhesion to a surface, you have two options. The first option is what is the total number of bacteria that have ever attached to your surface? That could take a while. The other part is what is the rate of attachment of bacteria to your surface during the linear phase? So when the bacteria are no longer hindered by steric interactions, so they're not being bumped off by nearby bacteria, they're unimpeded to your surface, they will typically attach in a linear fashion. This is what's known as the initial adhesion rate or the J0. So if you slow the initial adhesion rate, you are basically performing some type of anti-fouling effect. So if you're looking for anti-fouling, you can look for a reduction in J0, and that's enough. <clears throat> you could also look for the total number of bacteria at time infinity, but at time infinity, we never really have. <laughs> <clears throat> so basically, when I showed this graph earlier, this is actually different J0s from the centrifugation experiment. And these are basically the linear portions of this particular curve here. If I ended up going beyond 15 minutes, it would actually flatten out because of bacterial interactions uh, where you have electrostatic repulsion between the bacteria on the surface. <clears throat> Here's another one that I like to, to tease my uh, students in the lecture. This is also very important for you about trying to read literature and understand literature. What we have here is an experiment. You don't need to know a lot about the details. They have four different surfaces that they created. The four different surfaces have different hydrophobicity product, uh, properties. So they have their contact angles here and the surface roughness here. So those are the two things that they've changed within their properties. And they drew a straight line in their data. Can anybody tell me if that's a good idea or a bad idea and why? Yeah, I'm going to. Yeah, there is that. Yes. So the, this, the same order here, you have yellow, green, uh, sorry, yellow, blue, green, then red. So the order is the same. That is one. Something else related to drawing a line through the data, though. Okay, let me see. Can everybody see the numbers on the x axis? Uh, sorry, the y axis on the top graph? No? Okay, what if I was to tell you that the red dot was wrong and I moved that dot to the second number from the bottom? How would the line change? So I'm moving this one 
down here. If you drew a line, how would the line change? Would it change a lot or would it change a little? <laughs> how many say a lot? How many say a little? <laughs> It actually will change a lot because you're talking about an endpoint of a line. Typically, when you draw a line of best fit, the two endpoints dictate most of the line. When you see a confidence interval of a linear regression, the middle part is very small and the outsides are very large. So you have this point that is very far away in both cases and it's dictating the line. So while there is a relationship, <laughs> and it does look linear, I would be very hesitant about calling it a linear relationship <laughs> because of that reason. <clears throat> so uh, when we're talking about coatings, so we've, we've talked a little bit about nanoparticles. How many here are actually working with coatings? Couple in the front? Nobody else? <laughs> We're really, really going for nanotechnology, right? You're not going to use your nanoparticles as a coating? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, <clears throat> we have here five things, uh, types of coatings or coating changes that can actually stop bacterial attachment. First one, foremost, pretty obvious, antibacterial coatings. You put something that's going to kill the bacteria, you're probably going to stop attachment. Polymer modification, I'll get into that one a little bit later. Hydrophobicity, we talked about the Teflon. This is where that nice picture is going to come in. Changing surface roughness and surface charge as well. So this is a picture, relatively old at this point. Uh, so old that I couldn't find it to give you a reference. <laughs> I searched for three days to try and properly cite this one for my lecture, according to Kronigan rules. And I could not find this in the literature. Maybe using chat GPT, I can pump this up there and they might find it. But <laughs> right now, I don't know where this comes from. But basically what we have is we have floating bacteria. We have a coating on top. So this is your surface. You have a coating and the coating contains silver nanoparticles that releases silver ions. These silver ions are antibacterial and they will kill the bacteria. So as bacteria come in, they get absorbed with enough silver ions, and then they die. Now, somebody asked a question in my first lecture. This is, the re this is one of the reasons why I responded in the way that I did. <clears throat> the dead bacteria here now form the conditioning film for the next bacteria to see it. So you will not, these next bacteria will then see these dead cells and attach to those rather than your silver ion nanoparticle solution. So when you're creating a coating in this effect, you're really only going for a temporary solution. You need to have enough of a burst to kill everything. And hopefully after the burst, your eukaryotic cells will then attach and you will get the, uh, the host cells to win the race. If you leave the ions here and hope that it's going to go for a long time, you are promoting a good chance for antimicrobial resistance development because those ions are just going to continuously diffuse and eventually they run out. <laughs> so you will get to a low concentration. The bacteria will see it, be able to adapt to it, and then you're going to, you're going to cause some trouble for yourself later down the road. <clears throat> it doesn't mean that these type of coatings are not a good idea, but all of these types of coatings have their own targeted use which is the reason why I'm bringing them up. <clears throat> the polymer brush surface, we had a little bit of a discussion with this about trapped water. Uh, you have trapped water in your nanoparticles. I think this was for Sean's lecture. <clears throat> if there's enough trapped water within his design, his particles were not going to be able to see it and they would then bounce off. The same is true if you have a, a lot of polymers here, you end up, under physiological conditions to have them stand upright. This is what's known as a polymer brush. Then you can think about it when you get this nice little blow up uh, 
bouncy castle and you start jumping up and down, well, you never really hit the bottom of it. So then you just bounce up and you leave. So the bacteria doesn't actually see the surface. This is an artificial in, uh, increase of the hydrodynamic radius of the surface because it's completely filled with a polymer brush. The bacteria does not see it and the bacteria leaps. This in theory lasts a little bit longer than antimicrobials because the polymers will recoil and come back just like a trampoline. The problem with this typically is that it's very loose. The attachment points are very loose on this particular end and the polymer brush is subjected to a lot of force in the, the horizontal region and you can actually get your coating to be removed before you actually want it to be removed. And then the bacteria actually sees the surface. And if you create pockets, you'll actually create trapping points for the bacteria to see your surface. So if you're going for say orthopedic implants where orthopedic surgeons like to use hammers to put it into the condition, probably not a good idea. If you're going for dental implants, where you're just gonna screw something in, more likely that this could be a solution. <clears throat> and here's a pretty picture that I talked about with uh, hydrophobicity. Thankfully, it's not anywhere close to lunchtime. <laughs> um, this study was done in 1989. Ethics committees will not allow us to do this experiment anymore. <laughs> I'm not exactly sure how they got away with it in 1989. <laughs> In this particular day, nine days of undisturbed plaque formation on the front tooth. Undisturbed. That means the patients were not allowed to brush their teeth or drink a mouthwash for nine days. <laughs> Thankfully, we have ethics committees now that we can't do this stuff to people. <laughs> but what they did was they put a nice little Teflon piece in the front. <laughs> and then they, they looked at the difference between the surrounding areas and what was on the Teflon. And as you can see with the oral bacteria, there were no actual attachment of the bacteria on the Teflon strip. <clears throat> so here, the hydrophobicity glued to the front tooth is actually preventing biofilm formation. But again, in my first slide, I said in general, researchers typically say hydrophobicity is a way to increase the front tooth, uh, not the front tooth, but the, the bacterial attachment. This is the tricky part about bacterial adaptivity. Everybody can adapt to their surrounding environments. So depending on how you test it, you can actually get Teflon to actually have bacteria. <laughs> so it's all a matter of all the surrounding areas, your surrounding parameters, and you can get very different results based on your testing parameters. So when I teach this course, I only test on the generics, the, the, the common themes, but always make them aware that there are ex exceptions to the rules. Here we have some surface roughness. Again, the more bacteria are more, uh, rough surfaces are more beneficial for uh, biofilm formation. Smooth, we even have uh, ultra smooth surfaces uh, that are available these days, but they're less susceptible to bacterial attachment. That does not mean that they will stop it permanently. Again, if you do a super smooth surface, what is the first thing that's going to happen? A conditioning film. <laughs> so you may, have, you may have a lubricating conditioning film where you may still have a smooth surface, but you may have a little bit rougher of a conditioning film depending on the proteins that are there. So you may start with a smooth surface but by the time the bacteria see it, it may be a little bit rougher. <clears throat> they had super smooth voice prosthesis that showed less growth, basically extended the life of the voice prosthesis by about 300%, but that still only makes it 14 days. <laughs> <clears throat> Surface charge, the one thing you need to know as chemists, bacteria under physiological conditions tend to have negative charges. Again, there are exceptions to the rule. Typically, if they have a positive charge, it's very, very small. Uh, talking about a couple, of, a couple of millivolts in the positive area, whereas bacteria can be in the minus 40, minus 60, 
uh, but typically between minus 20 and minus 40 uh, with the zeta potentials. So if you make a surface that is negative and the conditioning film does not form or the conditioning film is neutral, you will have electrostatic repulsion and you will have less bacterial adhesion. <clears throat> So also what is, no, no question, just, just hair. Does anybody have any questions right now? I haven't seen any hands whatsoever. No. Okay. <clears throat> so we have a longevity of surface coatings. If you're designing a coating, understand what you're designing it for. Know where you're going to place it. Know how long it needs to be there. Know if you need tissue integration. The, the optimum surface coating design is different for each case. Most times, surface coatings are not designed to be everlasting. So as mentioned, well, in my lectures, I talk about bacteria going over the same area with the conditioning film, and they just basically a, a drop their own extracellular material, uh, even if there isn't a conditioning film there, and then the bacteria will then attach to the extracellular material from the previous bacteria that didn't even attach. <clears throat> Coatings only must serve as a protection until the job is done for them. So you're looking for a long, long enough to protect against infection to return to a balance. If you need cellular integration, you need a longer term of protection. If you're talking about a temporary, you may not need as long as a, a, a long as protection. How many wear contacts? No, one. Uh, okay, well, contacts is one that is basically a temporary implant. <laughs> you put it in your eye, at the end of the day, you take it out. The reason for that, one, dryness of the eye, but two, you're able to re-sterilize. <laughs> And you don't, you don't want tissues to go ahead and integrate in your eye and your contacts. You'll never get them out. <laughs> so these are temporary implants. If you're designing your coating for contact lenses, you do not want to have tissue integration with your, with your coating. <laughs> if you're looking for hip implants, bone implants, now you want tissue integration. So it's all a matter of what you're targeting. Have that in mind when you're talking to a biologist. <laughs> don't say, I want, this to, I want this to be biologically tested. They're not gonna know what you need. <laughs> Have an idea in mind what you want and that, that'll help the uh, biologist or microbiologist give you uh, the proper results that you're looking for and hopefully really good results. <clears throat> when you do need tissue integration, your coding only needs to survive until you get the proper tissue integration. And this is what's known as the race for the surface. Basically, you're looking for the cells to occupy more space than the bacteria on your surface. If the cells win, there's not going to be enough space for the bacteria to overcome the cells and the immune system, and you will get a balance that you've previously had beforehand. If the bacteria win the race for the surface, well, they're going to kill the cells, and now you're going to have a sepsis loosening of your implant material or a degradation of it due to the acids from the bacteria metabolism products. <clears throat> so temporary tubes, uh, temporary implants, catheters, feeding tubes, voice prostheses, contact lenses, these do not require tissue integration. So here, the antibiotic releasing, Pretty good idea. Non-adhesive stuff that kills the bacteria immediately, but then allows for tissues to come in afterwards. These are good types of coatings for these type of materials. <clears throat> However, just because it's temporary, if you get an infection on a temporary implant, it can, it's basically as serious as if you get it in a permanent implant. So just because it's a temporary implant does not mean you can reduce your risk a bacterial infection, the, the, the causes or the, the diagnosis of these pathogens is just as serious and temporary as it is with permanents. The difference between temporary and permanent implants is that permanents do require tissue integration. T 
typically the biggest problem with permanent implants is a vascularization issue. Now you're looking for cell adhesion. And one thing I like to say in the course that I didn't actually put in these particular slides, when you're talking from cell biologists, cell biologists like to talk about extracellular matrix or ECM. They talk about adhesions with an O. Microbiologists, we talk about extracellular polymeric substances. They basically contain very, very similar material to ECM. They're almost one in the same. <clears throat> Bacteria have basically evolved themselves to mimic the host immune system to hide from it. Um, and they also use what we have as adhesins, uh, adhesins without the O. Um, we also talk about bacteria as bacteria, and we talk about eukaryotic cells as cells, even though both of them are cells. And we do that to try and uh, eliminate confusion in the literature when we're talking about things. Unfortunately, it's not 100% adhered to, but we try as editors to make sure that that distinction is there. <clears throat> So we also heard from a lot of our lectures about multifunctional nanoparticles. You can also have multifunctional coatings. So you can have an antimicrobial, but you could also have a pro-tissue integration type of material combined. So you can use dual, dual functionality surface chemistries in your coatings in order to try and promote different things. Just because you have different things independently does not mean they're going to work together when you put them together. You do have to test them as a combined entity in order to make sure you do have them. And again, the number of functionalities added can be increased further, but as Helder has mentioned, he covered a lot of topics that I would like to talk about in this lecture, but the number, you can add the number of functionalities, but the more that you do that, the less chance your product's going to get to the market because you have more steps into production more chances to make error in production, increase costs, and pharmaceutical companies or uh, medical implant device companies are not going to touch it. <clears throat> so you can have these as winning the race for the surface, but keep the synthetic process simple. And uh, I know that these are a lot of texts because I don't actually have a textbook for this course, but. <laughs> uh, if you have questions on here, I'm, I'm not going to sit and read through each one of these, but <laughs> um, basically that's basically you're looking for the appropriate in vitro evaluation method, which we get into in the second half of the lecture. <clears throat> and then we have the nanoparticles. Um, this is again from the earlier uh, talk, but I did put this in here because this is another way that you can modify the surface. Um, so I don't necessarily have to go in here because I did talk about all of these in the beginning. Was anybody not here in the beginning lecture? You got one? Okay, so basically these, the brief overview of these particular slides is that we have a photothermal nanoparticle and we were trying to use it to kill bacterial biofilms. We ended up doing a characterization, found the concentration, and then realized that when we tried to kill biofilms, we couldn't get into the biofilm. So we had a situation where we have a particle that we think it works, it works against planktonic bacteria, but we couldn't get it to work with the biofilm. However, when we incorporated into the biofilm, we were able to then see that we did have killing within the biofilm. So now all of our energy within this particular particle is to find a way to get it inside the biofilm to be effective. So when you're designing biofilm experiments, usually there is an image processing uh, that you're interested in. Whether you're interested in the entire biofilm, you're interested in individual cells, membrane proteins, DNA, uh, you could look at potentially uh, even further down the line. Uh, but basically we're looking at photography uh, or light microscopy. OCT, optical coherence topography, CLSM, you have different sizes here, and then SEM, and you can go even further down to transmission, which will go into more detail. 
So you can use these to try and identify what you're looking for. Uh, again, what you're looking for depends on what you're trying to do with your particular material. Not one of these is the optimum experimental condition for every biological problem. It's what you are trying to solve and what you need the information on that's going to dictate which of these methodologies is appropriate for your experiments. The one thing that I like to try and tell my students in Groningen, don't always fall to default with the material that you have in your lab. I can guarantee you that most universities do not have all of these pieces of equipment. They typically end up going for the one that they have in their lab and to design their experiments accordingly. This is the reason for collaborations. This is the reason for our strategic partnerships. We can use different materials from these and utilize these particular arrangements to find the optimum experiments for you and your material. <clears throat> Ideally, it would be us, but if we don't have it, we could probably lead you to somebody who does. <laughs> don't design your experiments just for what you have in your, in your hallway down the room. <laughs> Here we can see the OCT and the CLSM. Again, I told you that the CLSM does not include water or e uh, typically EPS is hard to find in the CLSM as well. Um, and these are just reconstruction models. So this is your CS CLSM reconstruction of a bacterial biofilm. And over here we have an OCT, which actually generates more water and you can actually see uh, more of the three-dimensional structure of a biofilm with the OCT. So if you're interested in, say, the average thickness of a biofilm, trying to do it under the confocal, you have so many gaps there, you're probably not going to get an accurate reading of your thickness of the biofilm. If you look at the OCT, you probably will get a much more accurate reading of the thickness of your biofilm. <clears throat> You can also do relaxation under the OCT, and you can do time lapse. So here we have pre-compaction. They ended up compacting the biofilm, and then they were able to see some relaxation under the OCT. Now, this is a very textbook definition of a biofilm. It's what's known as the mushroom, the mushroom shape. Uh, you end up with a small stack underneath where there's a little bit of water, uh, water tubes to pass nutrients and uh, materials and also get rid of waste. And then you have a lot of the bulk of the bacteria up in here. <clears throat> uh, also, there's a lot of different types of electron microscopy out there. A lot of them. I've seen a few of them actually in, in the tours of your facilities. <laughs> So you have a FIB SEM, you have a TEM, you have an SEM, very nice facilities. And again, it really all depends on what you're looking for. If you're looking for the whole cell, TEM is probably not what you're gonna be wanting to look for. Yes, you might be able to see it, but the resolution is gonna be so high that you're probably going to be missing something. If you're looking for organelles, protein complexes, molecules, now your TEM is what you're going to be looking for from a biological point of view. A lot of you are using the TEM for your nanoparticles and that actually does fit in this particular size. So you are using the appropriate equipment for that and you are getting the, the right images. <clears throat> and here we have FIB SEM reconstruction of a bacterial biofilm done in pieces. So you end up getting this nice little slice. Uh, that's one slice of many. They end up doing a three-dimensional reconstruction. They have the green pieces here, and then they also stained in red and then reconstructed in part D with the matrix components marked by red. And they did so with manual labor. So they, at this particular point, they didn't have an algorithm to put it in. This is 2012. By now, I'm sure they do have it. I haven't worked with the FIB SEM myself, but I'm quite certain the computer software programs now have stains for matrix components that can then do the reconstruction, uh, not by manual labor anymore. <clears throat> so in order to get the best picture of your bacterial biofilm, 
The ideal situation is that we combine all the techniques. You have CEF, uh, scanning electron microscopy. You have CLSM to forget your three-dimensional reconstruction. You also have uh, cryo-SEM, environmental SEM to get your matrix components. And you could do the FIB-SEM in order to get a three-dimensional reconstruction. You combine all of that and you get a nice picture of your biofilm. Problem, typically these bacterial bio, uh, experiments have over 100 samples. Can you think about how much work it would be to try and get all of those images for each one of those samples? <laughs> and then to quantify the information. It doesn't happen. So we pick our best one. <laughs> if we need to confirm it, maybe we do too. <laughs> but we pick our best one. And that's what this lecture is really trying to, to show you, is to try and optimize what you're looking for, what you need to tell the biologist you're looking for, go to that particular equipment and get the results you're looking for. <clears throat> this was a fun little project that I did to try and confirm everything with the uh, viscoelastic properties of biofilms um, when I was a PhD. I grew a nice little biofilm of Streptococcus mutans, took a nice little steel ball, ball bearing, dropped it into the biofilm, and took an inverted microscope image from a confocal. As you can see, you can see the steel ball is still there. <laughs> uh, from these side pictures, the steel ball is here, and the steel ball is here. And as I tried to go up a little bit, uh, the steel ball kind of disappeared within the XY coordinates. But what is interesting about this particular image, the green is the cells and the blue is the EPS. The blue moved further away from the ball than the green. And we will get into what that, what that means a, a little bit later when we talk about the fusion properties. But this basically confirmed what I was looking at within the viscoelastic properties of labeling the cells being the slow the EPS being in the middle, and of course, being confocal, we can't see the water. <laughs> There's also fish techniques that you can individually stain under fluorescence microscopy. You could also have fish under confocal with the staining properties. Two things about fish techniques though. The first, you need to know what bacteria you have in order to have the appropriate probe, and two, if you have a multi-species biofilm, like you would maybe find in the oral cavity, you only have a limited number of probes you can do because we have a limited number of colors that we can see. And typically the emissions and absorbance spectrums overlap. <laughs> so you're pretty much limited to about four different bacteria, five if you're really lucky, to get a mixed species biofilm under fish. <laughs> so you really have to be targeted as to what you're looking for and, and uh, know what you're looking for prior to go in. It's not necessarily good for unknown identification within biofilms. <clears throat> and I did see uh, s some talks about Raman spectrophotometry here as well. You can also use this for biofilm identification. It's relatively, well, this particular one is 2016, but it's still, relatively new within the microbiology part of as far as imaging biofilms and quantifying biofilms. Believe it or not, they still they can also use NMR techniques to quantify bacteria uh, identifications. From a synthetic organic chemist, I still don't realize how they can do that, but I have seen papers on it. <clears throat> and here, basically they convert their individual spectrums and then they can do the reconstruction of the biofilm based on their individual parts of the Raman spectrophotometry. Again, based on uh, probes and also metabolism products, uh, looking at both of the biofilm and then the surfaces that they're on. <clears throat> Another thing that we've seen a lot of, uh, your atomic force microscopes. <laughs> we've seen those as well here. Um, great tool to try and image biofilms especially with force attachments. If you start, uh, it's more so for individual cells, but you can also use it as far as surface roughness, get a thickness of your biofilm. Uh, 
If you use a dragging mode, however, you are going to destroy your biofilm as you drag it over the, over the surface. Uh, but you will get the initial image, but the second image you try to get is going to be completely different. And basically now comes the table for the students. I am, uh, this is a, I wanna say this is the six, uh, no, this is the microscope one. So this is not the six page, this is the two page one. <laughs> Um, but basically this one here, again, full article here. Uh, the full citation is here. I, I have a link, but I didn't upload it because I made it at five o'clock this morning. <laughs> uh, so we have this full article here, uh, and it basically summarizes a lot of the techniques that are discussed here. So if you're curious about it, it'll show you the advantages, the disadvantages, where it might be optimal, we have light microscopy, confocal, we have scanning electron, cryo SCM, environmental SCM, FIB SCM, uh, and atomic force microscopy. They didn't even get into the TEM within this particular one, but TEM is also available when you're looking for individual cells within a biofilm. You ne don't necessarily get a three-dimensional construction unless you get really fine slices, but you can, it is possible to do it. And I have seen reconstructions of 10 to do biofilm reconstructions. <clears throat> so we talked about uh, bacterial, uh, sorry, biofilm stages. One of the biggest confusions that students have in my course is that they confuse the stages of biofilm formation with the stages of bacterial growth. Now the stages of bacterial growth are in four. They will always be four. There's no, no confusion between four, five, and six, like there are stages in biofilm formation. We have what's known as the lag phase, or st uh, a stage of limited growth. We have the exponential or log phase. We have a stationary phase, and we have a death phase. Now, if you want your nanoparticles, your treatments, your nanomedicines to work, basically, you want to test in this region. <laughs> you will get the optimum results because most of the medicines that we target against bacteria either attack cell wall synthesis, they attack protein synthesis, they attack DNA replication. All of this requires energy. As they're being reproducing and, and, and going in this, they are using a lot of energy and you will stop them from producing it and you will get your best results. However, if you get your best results, it may not necessarily mean that you get translational uh, applications of your results to the clinic. You may show that you have these nice pretty pictures, um, but basically you're looking again for biofilms. Biofilms are not fast growing. They're more in the stationary phase or late stationary phase. So if you wanted to test against a planktonic stage, this is the area you wanna go at to try and mimic biofilm formation. You can kind of cheat the system by using that particular stage in the bacterial growth, reverting back to the initial definitions of biofilms that I told you earlier. Aggregates of cells, uh, or aggregates of uh, basically microbial cells or bacteria, embedded in a surface, uh, sorry, embedded in a matrix of EPS and associated with a surface. And in this case, the surface is each other because they are densely packed in here. There's a limited number of nutrients. They have made their EPS and they're going to be surrounded there. So you can mimic biofilm, uh, biofilm phenotype bacteria by using the late stage in the bacterial growth cycle. It's not perfect because it doesn't have that hard, hard surface interaction, but it does mimic it if you're trying to get a general idea of what you're doing. <clears throat> Over here, you'll get your best results. Over here, you'll get the most likely chance of clinical translational success with your experiments. <clears throat> However, all four of these stages exist simultaneously within the clinic. So ideally you kind of test all of them to see whether or not you get efficacy. <clears throat> so basically this particular slide was there if I forgot to mention this. 
Um, but basically the physiology, uh, physiology of bacteria in the late stationary phase is that that mimics the biofilms the most. Uh, they're affected by nutrient limitation. And the planktonic cells rapidly regain antibiotic susceptibility. If you take a late stationary phase bacteria culture, put a small bit of that into a new culture, the bacteria then regenerate and get back to their antibiotic susceptibility because they will get to their log phase. <laughs> yes. Oh. <clears throat> uh, hey, about this, um, I was wondering, I mean, you are saying that uh, if we want to test some you know, particle or something against biofilms to use the bacteria growth phase when they are in the stationary. But I was wondering if there is a artificial way or maybe not artificial. I mean, when someone really wants to create or drive the bacteria into um, biofilm mm -hmm. in a lab to test anything we want. So how easy is that? Uh, I mean, I guess the people do it. Yeah, so there, there's there's multiple. So this is, this is the start of the biofilm formation type yeah. of experiments and all the different types of biofilm growing devices. Um, again, you want the biofilm related devices to mimic your particular area. So if you're going to a blood vessel, you want a device that has a flow system associated with it. If you want to, if you're going to the dental area, you want something that has a high compaction <laughs> with it because you're going to get that pressure of chewing uh, and that yeah. type of thing. So you always want to have that, that growth of the bio, of the biofilm to be more clinically related to where, what you're trying to target. So that's one of the things that's really the target of this lecture. As chemists, as physicists, when you go to the biologist, know your target area. It helps the biologist know what they're going to do and treat your samples. But there's, a, there's, a, there's over 15 different types of devices to grow biofilms. If you want the most ready-made one, I would recommend a chemostat, which is a, an ongoing culture that is basically consistent throughout. And the, the simplest to work with in the, the lab? Simplest, the simplest to work with cheap. in the lab is a microtiter plate. The, the what? A microtiter plate. Yeah, and I've seen you guys do MTT assays. So, yeah, you can do, you can grow biofilms in microtiter plates and do uh, assays that way. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> and then the, the one that is similar but without any of these yeah. devices is this, the stationary. Yeah, so phase. if you're not growing a biofilm, uh, if you don't want to take the time for 24 hours or 48 hours of growing a biofilm after your individual culture, then you can use these late stationary phase. Say a company comes down and says, I need the results yesterday. They never want it tomorrow. They want it yesterday. <laughs> well, then you can pull this off and give them some type of direction. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> and again, the reversibility when you do make this transition is more of a phenotype rather than genetic alterations. Typically when microbiologists or biologists talk about antimicrobial resistance, we are talking about a genotype change. We're not talking about the, the resistance that's seen in biofilms that are then reversible or the tolerance that you get uh, from these particular cultures in the uh, stages of growth. So it's an important distinction that we have a phenotype change versus a, or a genotype alteration of resistance. <clears throat> and again, remarkably antibiotics with a good performance against stationary phase bacteria in vitro have proven more successful, not always directly translational, but more successful when we go to the in vivo situations. <clears throat> Uh, did you get that one? Okay. <laughs> um, again, I'm not interested that you know that this is Pseudomonas, uh, but I have this particular up uh, here because this picture shows a lot better than my TEM images did about the extracellular material surrounding the cell. In this particular case, it's known as a capsule because it's a, a well-defined area. The TEM images that I have is just more of a loosely associated material around the cell but some bacteria can actually have this material trapped directly around the cell. And as you can imagine, if this bacteria is trying to infect your surface implant or you're trying to invade it with your nanoparticle, 
you need to penetrate that first before you will ever see the cell. Again, thinking about the hydrodynamic radius that I had shown earlier, it's not going to see the bacteria because it has that protective shell. And this shell is actually comprised of predominantly materials from the extracellular polymeric substance matrix that is found within biofilms. So a lot of the material that is formed with the EPS matrix can be found within that capsule. And it's just a tightly organized uh, piece of protection. <laughs> And then I did, I did mention the adhesions. Again, if you're working with cell biologists, there is an O here. For microbiologists, there is no O here. It is not a spelling mistake. It is designed specifically to keep the difference between the two, uh, but they both have similar functions and microbiologists are really bad at naming things. Uh, so we basically, an attach of adhesions, it's an adhesive device that's used to help the bacteria find, locate, and attach to the surface. Typically, then you form specific structures and generate the matrix around the cell. <clears throat> and again, in general, it's a two-step process. You get initial contact with the substrate, and then you get the polysaccharide production, which then gives you that uh, irreversible attachment and also the EPS production which then leads to the biofilm formation. Currently, microbiologists have two forms. We have the reversible attachment and the irreversible attachment. The only difference between the two is we take the material, go like this, if it's still there, it's irreversible. We don't typically have a good way to define it, uh, yet I am, some of the work that I'm doing with the dancing bacteria is hopefully going to define that in more scientific terms. Uh, but that's currently what we're going with. <clears throat> and that's why the link between the polysaccharides and the irreversible stage is currently linked because that's really the defining characteristic between them as of right now. <clears throat> and again, it's not well known where the, tradition act the transition actually happens between reversible and irreversible. And I'm hoping my dancing uh, bacteria experiments will help define that. <clears throat> The important thing to note here is that adhesions can be actually produced related to environmental stresses. If you stress a bacteria, it can then produce adhesions to try and help itself be protected. Um, it could be from that or it could be hardwired into the system, like you saw with the capsule uh, in, into the development program to be there. Sometimes the flagella itself can be used as an adhesion even though it's a propeller-like system, it can be used to then sense the surface and become a hold fast and lock itself into the, onto the surface. The third type of, uh, we talked about sessile or biofilm type uh, bacteria. We've talked about planktonic or free floating bacteria, but there is a third type of uh, phenotype within bacteria and it's called biofilm detached. And what this is, is it's an in-between section between biofilms and planktonic bacteria. When biofilms are full, there's not enough nutrients. We did say that there's this detachment phase. This detachment phase is used to spread the bacteria to a new location and then grow a new biofilm where there's more nutrients. If that is the case, what do you think the primary goal of those bacteria would be? Yeah, the primary goal would be to adhere to the next surface. So basically, rather than trying to uh, reproduce like they would in the planktonic state or form an EPS matrix like they would in the biofilm state, 90% of the energy of biofilm detached cells goes into attachment to the new surface. So it is a distinctly different phenotype uh, for the first couple of hours after detachment from the biofilm in order to attach to a new location. If the bacteria cannot find a new location within the first two, so maximum four hours, it will revert back to the planktonic state. <clears throat> so these three phenotype states do go intertwined. They all have different purposes, but it's important to note that if you're trying to treat an infection, you're going to also see biofilm detached cells 
and you need to also try and make sure you try and combat those. <clears throat> now I have one other exercise here about trying to read or critically read literature. <clears throat> this morning I talked about uh, environment, uh, without giving you too much of the answer, the error within biological systems. This is a paper that I had trouble trying to publish my first paper as a PhD because the journal said we've already published this in 1999. Why should we publish it again? <clears throat> so basically this is a, 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 it's a nice paper, but I bring this up as an example of how to crit critically read without going into too much detail of the protocol because it's not necessary for you to understand this exercise. It's not even necessary for my students to understand it for the exercise, but they have a growth medium. They do different things with it, separate it out within ions, water, nutrient solutions, do different procedures that you do in the laboratory with cells, and then test for, for a few uh, uh, viability type of uh, organisms. And this is the table that they have. I want you to focus on this one here, um, and basically what it is, is these are their controls. So these are their controls, their average values here, and you're looking at roughly about 10% error. So, 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 so for those of you who can't read it, and I, I know it gets small because there's big tables and I try and cut and paste and blow them up, but roughly you're looking at about a 10% error in the tables. <clears throat> and again, I blew up the different sections of that big long table to try and make it bigger so that everybody can see. And again, you're looking, you know, here's a good 20% error, a little bit more closer to the 30% error that I had mentioned earlier. And now I wanna to get to this particular table. This is the results that they present. Can anybody see something interesting about this particular table? Don't worry, my students in my course don't see it in this table either. <laughs> How about if I go to this table? <laughs> what, well, yeah, no error bars. What number do you see most? If I go back to the actual table of their control group, <laughs> How many of these do you think would actually give you 100%? Including their own error bars. <laughs> Not a lot, right? So in critically reading this particular paper, I started looking. Does anybody see a number between 90 and 100? between 100 and 110? What happened, and I can't confirm this because I don't know personally the scientists involved, but it is very likely from the tables involved that they used their controls plus or minus the standard deviation that they provided in their reference table. If it was within their standard deviation, they classified it as 100% in their results. If it was outside of their area, they gave you an actual number. So if we go back to here and say, okay, we have 6.9 plus or minus 2.4. If we go to the minus side and say we have a 4.5, they would classify that as 100. Now, can anybody do, does anybody have a calculator quickly and do 4.4 divided by 6.9? Yeah, it's about 0 0.6 or something. <laughs> it's about two thirds. Huh? 4.4 divided by 6.9. Okay, 0 0.637, which means they would write 64 in their table. But if they had 0.1 more, they would have classified it as 100. 
So in that particular data set, they would not have anything in the 70s, anything in the 80s, or anything in the 90s in their table. <laughs> so you have to be very careful, especially, I mean, look, this is just ridiculous. You'd never see this in a biological system. <laughs> You'd never get 100% in a biological system that way. Uh, so you have to be careful, even with published literature, of understanding the protocols, understanding the results, so you don't carry over some of the mistakes or some of the hidden data that they have that would then influence your results. And this is the reason why I bring this up. It's not that this work is, again, I still, I still compliment the author, but they still should be much more clear on how they write this particular one. The data suggests the protocols do affect the surface properties. I did continue that and created the equation that I did and then got published. They don't go really into an explanation why within the paper. The numbers showing 100% are unreliable as biological systems, and they tried to avoid telling you how they actually came up with those numbers. <laughs> so as much as I read through that paper, I probably read it in, in full at least 10 times, could not find a way that how they calculated it. I don't think you can get away with that anymore. You really do have to specify your processes. <clears throat> but even the controls would not get 100%, which gave me the red flag. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> and yes, I don't catch every red flag either. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so again, the bacteria, uh, not, this is an example of things that can go on a bacteria. It is very likely that a bacteria does not contain all of these at the same time. Uh, but this is a schematic that they have as far as extracellular uh, material on the outside. We saw the capsule. You could have cellulose, the LPS. Uh, you could have fimbria or flagella as far as movements and other materials trapped along the side of the membrane. So again, going back to the original talk, you have to be careful about damaging the extracellular material on your cell when you're doing your harvesting techniques. This is to make sure that what you're testing is actually true to nature. If you test against a bald bacteria and you're trying to test against a bacteria that has these particular things on the outside, you are testing two different types of environments. So you wanna try and test something that is as close to nature as possible so you get your best translational area uh, representation of results. This goes back to Helder's talk. This goes back to Ali's talk, Prashant's talk. It's all about translation and making sure what you have in the early stages gives you the highest success rate at the end. You can have great results, great papers uh, with the, the high impact and making your material look really nice, but then you'll reach a dead end. So it would be good for academia, but then that material never goes to help patients in, uh, with, with what you're designing to do. So you always wanna try and make that design to be as relatively uh, relation to what your actual goal is. And that is why there's not one universal methodology that is good for biofilm testing, because all of you are likely trying to solve different problems. <laughs> So again, from the beginning talk, we have this here, the centrifugation speed settings, basically the shear wrapping things off. And I did relate that to your nanoparticles, your nanomedicines. If you're doing these core shell designs and you do a high compaction, whether it be 10,000 G, 15,000 G, you're going to start to disrupt and destroy all that hard work you did in creating your nanoparticle. <laughs> Then we're going to get into uh, diffusion characteristics. Uh, you'll notice that this is a different type of slide material. Uh, Prashant Sharma, who is here, is the one that is in charge of this particular lecture within the course. Um, but he, he basically comes up with four different diffusion methodologies. You have the interdiffusion. In an alloy, they tend to migrate from regions from a high concentration to a low concentration not very interesting for biofilms. You have self-diffusion, again, solids to atoms. May happen within a biofilm, uh, but not, not, less, uh, not really important there. You can have vacancy diffusion within a biofilm. 
again, you have the water channels, you have the microenvironments, you can have voids of, of nutri nutrient wastes and stuff like that. So you can have migration within the biofilm with these vacancy areas or movement within the EPS. But the one that happens the most is the interstitial diffusion. This is what happens most. The smaller molecules will move through the larger molecules. And this is what you saw with my ball bearing experiment, dropping the ball. The EPS, which is smaller, moved through the cells, which were less moving, and the water, which was not visible, moved through more. So this is the one that typically happens uh, through, or at least more rapid than vacancy diffusion within the biofilm. Uh, and, and that creates the movement and also the viscoelastic properties of the material. <laughs> then we have this nice table. So we talked about the imaging. We talked about uh, a little bit of the theory. And now you come to a biologist and say, okay, I'm going to, I need to know the weight or uh, dye staining, crystal violet staining. You can get the biofilm biomass. You can look for metabolic activity cellular biomass, whatever it is that you are interested in, we have a technique for it. <laughs> we talked about, this is the imaging here. So all of these imagings, and then within here, we have techniques and stains to look for different types of materials that you're looking for. Again, it all depends on what you're interested in, what we can do to help you out. The more you know as background to what you wanna do, where it's gonna go, what you're interested in us to find, we can then put the appropriate stain, the appropriate method, give you the results you need to optimize your experiments and move forward. <clears throat> Eventually, these are the indirect measurements. Once the biofilm starts, then you have in situ and ex situ measurements where you can then uh, go a little bit further. Again, believe it or not, it's the same review as the other table. <laughs> as you can see, uh, very popular scientists that uh, formulate these reviews and put them into, uh, I wanna say easy to digest, but it's busy, but it's there for you to find what you need. <clears throat> Everybody okay with pictures? Nobody has questions right now. I've been going on and on and on. <laughs> I'm just that clear, huh? <clears throat> so <clears throat> methodologies, Micro titer plate, how many have performed an MTT assay? All right, not too bad for chemists. <laughs> the MTT or XTT, basically we have the same type of procedure. Uh, I've seen some of your presentations where you have almost the same picture as I do up here, <laughs> easily grabbed from the internet. Uh, I, I typically try and grab it from actual scientific literature, but sometimes it's not, the best ones are not there. <laughs> Um, so here you get a nice diversity of stain depending on the metabolic activity. <clears throat> However, because you're talking about biofilms growing on the base of the microtiter plate, you have the uh, distinction of potentially disrupting the biofilm and dissolving the metabolic products uh, before you actually do the assay. So if your technique is rough, you can get uh, very different results. And I see that when I do the microbiology course with my students, I have them grow a biofilm and do MTT assays. And the results are all across the board because their pipetting skills, they basically remove all of the biofilm from the bottom of the well. <laughs> and then they tell me that a, a grown biofilm with a control doesn't have any metabolic activity. <laughs> If you want to try and avoid that situation, you can work with it with what's known as a Calgary device. Basically, it's a, it's a micro titer plate, but it has a specialized lid with pegs in it. And you grow the biofilm on the pegs rather than on the base of the, bio, uh, base of the micro titer plate. So these pegs will then go on the top inside the well. Your growth medium is there. You don't have to worry about if your nanoparticle is going to settle inside of the biofilm. You don't have to worry about if you're pipetting and disrupting it as you're removing the liquid and growth medium. And you can grow the biofilm on these particular pegs. It's also, it's pretty much just as easy as working with a micro titer plate, but it solves some of the issues as far as technique and potentially settling issues within your biofilm. <clears throat> Another type of test that you can do, I don't know anybody who is actively doing it besides what's in the literature. Uh, 
but it's known as the biofilm ring test. Basically, you have magnetic particles, iron particles, that you put into, into the biofilm. <clears throat> As you grow a biofilm and you put a magnet underneath, if you have a full-grown biofilm, do you think the iron particles are going to aggregate in the middle underneath the, the magnet? No. So this is how they determine whether or not there's biofilm growth. If you can see the dots of the magnetic particles from the iron, you do not have biofilm formation. If you cannot see the iron particles aggregate, then you have biofilm formation. <laughs> this is a disruptive test, but it's a kind of a neat little way that you can see visually whether or not you have biofilm formation. Again, this works typically, you can see also in a 96 well plate. <clears throat> Then you can get to a Robbins device. Uh, a Robbins device is a, a tricky type of way that you can introduce flow. It's a shortcut to a chemostat where you basically introduce a culture throughout the device, whether it be flat or uh, involved in a pipe tubing. And here you have coupons in each one of the little areas here where you can remove your biofilm, test it, and then re-screw it back in. So you can basically have a continuous culture, test your sample. Yes, you are destroying your sample depending on what type of test you're running, but you can then put it back into the culture and regrow it on the same coupon. <clears throat> a drip flow biofilm reactor. Now, as a microbiologist, I told you that we're not basically very good at naming things. Can anybody think of the mechanism of a drip flow biofilm reactor? Gravity, <laughs> basically we have a system here and we put it up 10 degrees and we watch the, the medium drip and we grow the biofilm with gravity. <laughs> but again, it works on the coupon part. You take the coupon, that's where your biofilm formation, your surface or your material is gonna grow. And then you use that for any type of imaging device or testing device that you are trying to do. <clears throat> You can also have what's known as a CDC biofilm reactor or a rotary, bio, uh, rotary act reactor. And here, basically, the inner side spins, the outer side stays uh, consistent. And now you have a little bit of shear that comes in when you're trying to grow your biofilm. So this could be something that could be used when you have something that requires flow. <clears throat> yes. So this inner part here is a tube that comes in. It has your coupons, the medium is there and it spins around and you get a nice little uh, a turning mechanism. <clears throat> For those of us old enough, it's kind of like a record player. <clears throat> we also have a CDFF or constant depth film fermenter. If you need a little bit more compaction or you need to grow a biofilm of a consistent depth. <clears throat> Say you have a stain penetration that's only gonna go 50 micrometers deep. You don't wanna have a biofilm that grows 200 micrometers and then say you have a 50 micrometer biofilm because you can only stain 50 meter, micrometers. <clears throat> so you can use a constant depth film fermenter to then uh, basically limit the size of your biofilm, even though it may overgrow. There is a scraper off the top that will keep cutting the biofilm to the appropriate depth. Uh, and basically all the coupons within will be growing the same because the, that cutoff solution is going to be uh, pushed over onto areas that are available. And then once they're all full, they will just fall off the edge. This also increases a little bit of compaction. You, you can imagine a sideways force will then start to push down, create a little bit of a friction. So typically here you'll get a little bit more of a denser biofilm than you'll find in, in nature. <clears throat> And here's a schematic of a parallel plate flow chamber. The one important piece here is that you have a bubble trap to try and trap any excess gas as you're trying to put things in so that you don't automatically explode everything off the surface and you have bare, bare uh, material again. And within the parallel plate flow chamber, again, we typically have laminar flow until we get a protein coating uh, conditioning film or the first cells that attach to the system. <clears throat> we also do microfluidic devices, uh, not necessarily for particle intervention, but we can do this for bacterial growth as well. 
In this particular case, what we were trying to do is have a membrane on the top. We had immune cells on the bottom and we had growth medium and bacteria on the top. And we were interested to see whether or not the immune cells would then migrate towards the infection on the top. <clears throat> so yes, we can also utilize microfluidics uh, for biofilm formation. The great part about this is it requires a lot less media for us. Yes, question. Uh, I want to say it was P P M M A. I want to say it was a P M M A uh, membrane, but I can't be 100% sure. It was about five years ago. <laughs> uh, but it, it was that membrane. It became a little bit more transparent when wet, so that we would be able to see under the microscope. <clears throat> The tricky part here is because we had a top bottom system, we had to make the chip small enough so that the microscope would be able to see through the polymer and also through the membrane. <laughs> so it was relatively thin, which made it a little bit hard to, to stick together with, after the, the oxidation stays with the plasma, but we did get it to work. We got some nice results and resulted in one of the organ on a chip papers that I ended up getting a question on during the breaks uh, <clears throat> as, as that part of thing. And then the last methodology here is basically the chemostat. Uh, and this was an answer to uh, the question earlier. It's the simplest biofilm model. Basically, it's an ongoing culture with coupons. And anytime you want to test, you just pull the coupon out, test it, replace it. It will back, basically grow back to the original culture of uh, species composition, thickness, uh, stiffness and all those uh, physical properties will be relatively consistent through that. <clears throat> the only problem is they are excessively expensive to operate because you need to continuously feed them with media. Uh, they're typically rather large so that you have a lot of uh, individual samples that you can test. So you'll find these more in industry than you will find them in academia due to the sheer expense of operating them. And now I come... Uh, yeah, just some more text for the students to try and memorize. You don't need to do that. <laughs> uh, but now we come to the six-fold table. Again, the exact same uh, research article. So if I haven't been a uh, advocate to study this particular piece of literature, I don't know what else I can do for you. Um, but here, again, we have all of the devices, the, the intended application, Advantages and disadvantages. We have the micro titer plate, the Calgary device, biofilm ring test, Robbins device, drip flow, rotary, flow chamber, uh, microfluidics, continue, continued. So you can see even, even the journal couldn't fit it on one page. <laughs> yep. Then we go here. Methods to measure biofilm. So they ended up. So they ended up with the different types of procedures. Uh, now, how to grow them, and now how to measure them. You have colony forming units. Whether or not you want to look at the genetic structure with a qPCR. I didn't get into a lot of these, but these are on the, these particular tables. Again, what it is you're used, what interested in, we could, we probably have a means to test. <clears throat> you just have to know what it is and tell us what you want. <laughs> If you just say we want this tested from a biological standpoint, now you can see why we give you this confused look. <laughs> then you can have the chemical methods, the microtiter plates, phospholipid based EPS extraction. So we can actually test the types of comp compounds in your EPS. If you tried to eliminate one, we can see whether or not one is missing. Then we have the micro microscopy techniques. This was from a previous table, but they included it towards the end here as a summary of their review. So again, the light microscopy can focal, the scanning. I believe this is the same table from previous ones, but it's in different lectures. So I just put this one as a combined towards the end. Again, we see the focus beam ion, atomic force microscopy. And yes, wow, that's a lot, but again, the reason why biologists look at you when you say you want biological testing as confusion is because it is a lot. We don't know what you want. <laughs> so the idea behind this lecture is to give you a little bit more understanding. When you go to a biologist, what are you looking for? What can we help you with? Trying to teach you the language of a biologist so that we can help you in the best way possible. <laughs> Again, 
The objective is to pick the proper combination. As chemists, you may not necessarily be able to do that, but if you have an idea behind what you want, you can, in a collaboration with a biologist, pretty easily come up with the appropriate method and be able to test it. Then the other, the last section that I have with this particular talk, is basically biofilm resistance, antimicrobial resistance. Um, there was some talk about it earlier, uh, but by 2050, it's actually going to surpass all known death, causes of death. And the reason why is because we're getting more and more resistant bacteria. As of right now, I believe there are three known superbugs that are resistant to all known antimicrobials. And it's only going to increase as we continuously use antimicrobials. So with that perspective, there's going to be more and more deaths associated with antimicrobial resistance. Well, how do they form? The failure of the antibiotic to penetrate the biofilm. If you don't have a delivery system and you put an antibiotic in there, that biofilm is basically going to become antimicrobial resistant. Slow growth and the stress response, I didn't necessarily cover that in this particular lecture. It's a little bit less interesting for chemists, but basically bacteria have a way to hide and hibernate. So if they hide from their metabolism, they can go into a slow growth state or a no growth state known as a persister cell and they can have an individual response to a physical or chemical stress and become resistant to it. <laughs> this heterogeneity within the biofilm, usually biofilms are not a single species. They're multiple species, multiple co components. Again, right from the beginning, I asked you why biofilms are formed. It's all for a protection mechanism. The more organisms, the more micro environments that are there within the biofilm, the more protection they have against any individual stress. Uh, I didn't talk about quorum sensing except in name only, but that's another way that resistance can be transferred. And then the biofilm phenotype is a method of resistance, not from a gen genetic perspective, but it's a way that the biofilms can adapt to your antimicrobial and then create a genetic response. So within the biofilm phenotype, there is that increased resistance you may need to increase that dose to make sure you have a full clearance and you don't promote the uh, resistance. And what I was very interested to hear about was the industrial platform. Uh, there were some nice talks from uh, you guys, uh, actually from your group actually, <laughs> about this particular pathway, uh, the industrial problem of trying to find new antibiotics. Basically, companies are looking for the simplest way to make a buck. So they take the known antibiotics, change a functional group, remarket it, put it back on the market. Problem, bacteria mutate very, very quickly. Sometimes as quickly as 40 minutes. So they create a new generation in the log phase in every 40 minutes. If you put a single functional group change for a bacteria that already has a mutation for resistance against another one, how many generations do you think it's gonna take before it mutates and finds a way around that new functional? <laughs> Probably within the first hundred, which means your new functional bacteria, uh, functional material that the companies are looking for and trying to create the new drug is probably going to last a couple of weeks before it's got resistance. <laughs> So I was very pleasantly surprised to hear that you guys are actually going out into uh, the fungal areas, trying to find new, new drugs, new, new compounds that are being developed. <clears throat> and again, one of the aspects is economical. Helder mentioned that quite uh, clear in his, pres his lecture. You know, you have that 10 to 12 year window of developing a new drug from scratch, about 3.2 billion euros in actual development costs. <laughs> you wonder why drugs are expensive? Well, they're trying to recoup that initial cost. <laughs> it's not that the drug itself is that uh, expensive to produce at that particular point, but they're trying to recover all of those research costs from the previous part before they lose their patent money. <laughs> the other one is technological. So basically the breakdown of the one successful platform. And this is where I'm glad to see that UNAM is actually reintroducing this, this particular pathway. 
I believe that there's a lot of new compounds that are available. One thing I bring up in Kronigan about this particular part, the last time this pathway was open, we destroyed tons of rainforests and all this other stuff trying to mine and overmine bacteria samples. So just be careful of how you work with it. Very happy you're working with it, but don't overmine trying to find the right compounds. So again, by overmining, basically the, the pipeline was run, run dry and basically the companies ended up doing these analogs, which then bacteria can then easily mutate and, and try and get around. And with that, that is my lecture. I hope it was interesting enough that you now have an idea how to talk to biologists. Uh, I didn't see many questions throughout, but I'm hoping to have a nice discussion now if there's any, any questions. <laughs> Uh, very, very excellent talk. Thank you very much. I have one question. You mentioned three phenotypes. Yes. But at the same time, you mentioned there is no genetic modification. So how can we distinguish these phenotypes? Okay. Yeah. So the question was the three phenotypes. You have the sessile or biofilm types. You have the planktonic or in free-floating suspension. And you have the biofilm dispersed. Now, two of those phenotypes are very easily identifiable. It's either in a biofilm or it's in a suspension. There currently is not an easy way to test for biofilm dispersed cells. Um, how the, the researchers have done it here, and we recently had a PhD defense on biofilm dispersed cells as well within the university, within our department. Basically they grow a biofilm and look for the planktonic cells around it. And then if they see a genetic change that's different from the sessile and the planktonic, then they know they have the third phenotype. <laughs> but right now there is no easy way to collect and harvest only that particular type. It's, there is, you can think of it as a chemistry transition state analog, um, but thankfully it lasts hours instead of milliseconds. <laughs> Thank you for your lecture. And my question is, what happens when two different biofilms meet on the same surface? Uh, both uh, fight or what? Uh, yeah, so when two different biofilms are trying to compete for the same surface, two things can happen. It's either going to be a competitive advantage and one is going to wipe out the other. Uh, you see that some of the fungals will create biocides to try and overpower other ones. Bacteria can also do that. Pseudomonas is one of those that creates an antibiotic that basically kills the surrounding competition. And then it basically can then grow freely around it. The other is it could be an incorporation. So you get, you're living in a neighborhood. You have another group of people that comes in. You get along together, you go to you know, barbecues together, you, you interact, you basically become one big community. And this can also happen when two biofilms meet. They could have that horizontal gene exchange and then be incorporated uh, into one single biofilm. So both things can happen. Um, how it is depends on the situation, location, all the environmental factors that would drive in a particular direction. Okay, thank you. Hello, uh, thank you for the talk. It was really interesting. Uh, my Thanks. question is uh, a particular question about what happened inside the biofilm. Mm -hmm. um, I understand that uh, pathogenic islands on the genus for resistance mm -hmm. are inside plasmids. So I wanna know if inside the biofilm is a good place in which uh, the DNA exchange is possible mm -hmm. and for you, how is the best form to study? Okay, um, good questions. Uh, <clears throat> basically, biofilms have a, I think it's a 100-fold mutation rate higher than uh, the planktonic, um, and that's due to the horizontal gene exchange. A part of the materials and why we don't want chemists to call extracellular material polysaccharides is that DNA, whether it be from dead cells within the biofilm, 
or just lice cells as they die through the natural growth cycle are trapped within the matrix. And this DNA is free to transform and, and get that horizontal gene transfer, which speeds up the mutation rate. <clears throat> That's one way to do it. Uh, there are two different types of resistance within a biofilm. One is the genetic one. So that's withheld within the plasmids. And that will have that horizontal gene transfer. The other is basically the phenotype resistance. So you're creating a physical barrier with this EPS matrix that could potentially absorb your particular antibiotic. That means that the antibiotic is not going to get to the base of the biofilm and create that resistance of the biofilm as a whole. But that's not incorporated into a plasmid. That is basically a physical barrier that is creating that resistance. Within a biofilm, both exist. Um, the ones that we're trying to avoid is the plasmid transfer. The, the, the other ones are a phenotype. So as soon as the bacteria comes out of the biofilm, they become susceptible again. <clears throat> Did that answer everything you're looking Was that what you were looking for? Okay, <laughs> more or less. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you very much for your talk. Um, I'm wondering in your experience for how long you can maintain uh, a biofilm and study different properties of nanoparticles or, or I don't know, something, but how, for how long, how many days you can, you have to study <coughs> the biofilm? Uh, different bacteria species have different metabolism rates. Um, if you do not exchange the media, this could be anywhere between 24 hours and two weeks <laughs> um, if you don't exchange the media. If you, uh, we currently have an ongoing project where typically you would have to exchange the media within 24 hours, but because we use it as a 2% growth medium uh, and most 98% buffer, we're actually able to maintain the solution for seven days and, and do, uh, no, actually, sorry, 14 days um, uh, with a culture that is normally supposed to be exchanged in 24 hours. But we didn't want to remove the leaching effect of the antimicrobial within the liquid, uh, that if we exchange that medium, we would have a problem because the first batch load of, uh, or the big burst of antimicrobials would be eliminated as soon as we exchange the media. So we wanted to make sure that was still in the process. So that's why we diluted the sample in order to make it last longer. Mm -hmm. So there are ways to manipulate the, the protocols in order to make things last longer. Um, but different bacteria species, if you're normal, going for normal growth cycles, 24 hours without an exchange of media, if you exchange media, they can go indefinitely. <laughs> <laughs> but if you if you only add more no just, media, so you you remove and add new ah okay it's just it's a remove and add new um, and sometimes there's even a washing step in between to make sure that the the toxins are, are eliminated uh, for example the microtiter plates which is a closed system with a very limited volume you want to make sure those toxins are eliminated so they don't kill the cells <laughs> okay. Okay. thank you. <clears throat> It's me again. Yeah. <laughs> um, in your research with biofilms, have you used um, phagos or virus to control them? Uh, yeah. So in my experience, again, I came as a chemist. I have tried in classroom areas to work with bacteriophages, which is bacteria viruses that then go ahead and infect the DNA of the bacteria. Um, I have not gotten them to be successful in growing. My experience is that they are specific to the phage and the strain. So it's not just say an E. coli, but it's an E. coli with a strain number, sometimes even a subspecies of a strain number that is reacting to an individual phage. So in order to be effective, you really need a DNA match between phage and strain. Um, there are microbiologists within our department that are handling phage work. Uh, more successfully than I do with the, the students. Um, but my research has not gotten there, although it is a possibility to combat the antimicrobial resistance. Okay, okay. <clears throat> there are other questions? 
Uh, thank you very much. Uh, well, I was wondering if what kind of bacteria can create these uh, biofilms, because I was wondering if you can use some uh, bacteria that are beneficial for us, for example, bifidus or lactobacillus, so we can create some kind of shield that we can use instead of, well, um, yes, instead of yeah. creating, like, waiting for microbiota yeah. to grow, mm -hmm. so we can create this biofilm and just add it to our organism? Yes. Um, so you mentioned lactobacillus. It's basically a probiotic. Um, and basically, one way to combat biofilm growth is to have a non-pathogen bacteria outgrow the pathogen bacteria. So this is what we do when you, you have those probiotic yogurts and milk. We basically infect you with 10 times to the power 12 of bacteria and hopes that some of that attaches and then outperforms the pathogens that would be in your system that are creating the imbalance. Uh, <clears throat> as far as what bacteria can create biofilms, pretty much anyone that has an EPS structure that will maintain a three-dimensional structure. Uh, there is some debate about calling bacteria that have EPS molecules, but not a complex 3D structure, a biofilm. Uh, say strep mutans, for example, being one of them. Um, their, their biofilms are relatively flat, uh, but they do have those matrix components. Mm -hmm. So they do have the matrix components, but they don't necessarily hold a three-dimensional arc architecture. Um, so there is some debate about microbiologists to call it a biofilm because we're looking for that nice uh, structure. But as far as the definitions go that I have provided and that microbiologists agree upon, aggregative cells, EPS matrix, it doesn't mention three-dimensional structures, but EPS matrix and associated with the surface, then yes, it will form a biofilm. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, with, when you use the microfluidic devices, mm -hmm. uh, I think one problem is the rate of growing of, yep. of them. No? So maybe they can use all of the area or something like that. Uh, thinking in the device with the membrane, mm -hmm. um, what else you can see or what can what do you want to study with this device okay so you actually covered one of the interesting project the interesting results of that particular project we use the oct from a horizontal view to see both the top and the bottom section um, and basically what we did was we saw waves so our membrane was no longer flat after the flow we got nice little wave structures within there um, and thankfully, we decided to cut it very large so that it didn't actually go through and get dis dislodged within our system. Um, but we were able to see uh, the alveoli, for example, uh, of the cellular, uh, the cellular tissues and then the bacterial infection. I, I think it's the alveoli, but it's, <laughs> I'm not a cell biologist, but it's those, those structures uh, where they, they have those little arching bands uh, of the cell structures. We were able to see those, and then with the bacteria infecting, those got uh, a little bit destroyed, more flat, um, but we were able to see those type of structures when we were able to get the immune response. <clears throat> Hi. Yeah. Uh, thank you. First of all, thank you for your speech. It was yeah. really interesting. Oh, thank you. Uh, my question is, uh, in some sort of your uh, explanation you mentioned something about the encapsulated uh, bacteria yep. so um, uh, when i know that uh, uh, in this case the capsule has a very similar structure than the than the biofilm mm -hmm. but uh, most of the times uh, this type of bacteria are dispersed along the uh, infected zone yeah I, I mean uh, blood stream or yep. whatever so uh, what do you think is the best strategy to fight uh, against this type of infections because uh, we know that <laughs> yes <laughs> because of the capsule uh, it's a uh, very uh, hard to fight against this. Yes, so. that, that's a very interesting question, very good question. Um, again, there's going to be no one answer to that particular type of situation. 
if it's in the bloodstream, you're going to have problems because you don't want it to affect the proteins, the albumins, and, and, and the cells that are in the, uh, in the bloodstream. As again, the capsule is going to be related to in, in uh, ECM as well as the EPS uh, within the body. Um, but you are looking for something that can poke holes in the capsule, make it a little bit more porous, and then deliver the system to kill the cells. Okay. So that's the type of mechanism you're looking for to destroy the capsule um, and also trying to prevent it from adhering. If it's free floating in the blood and not adhering, your immune system is going to, the macrophages are still going to be able to attack it. Yeah. They will eventually find it and attack it even with the capsule. Yeah, because even uh, sometimes inside the, the macrophages or whatever, yes. <laughs> it's, it's really hard to uh, our organism or our immune yeah. system to fight them against yes. them. So. Yes, yeah, and, and uh, sometimes they actually, they're, they're, they're called breakout cells. So sometimes they actually do break free from the macrophages. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that, that we are aware that they do break out from the macrophages. We call it jailbreak, but uh, <laughs> um, th th that does happen when, when the bacteria is protected enough and the, ba the macrophage is not directly attacking it. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you so much. Well, well. Hi, Hi, thank you. Um, you talk about resistance, but to infectious bacteria, right? Uh, well, uh, it's resistance as a whole, um, even if you are commensal bacterial or your, your, your microbiome gets a resistance to an antibiotic, it can still have the horizontal gene transfer to a pathogenic bacteria that would okay. then be in the, in the system. So even though we would want our particular bacteria to survive, we don't want them to transfer the keys to the, to the lock mm. <laughs> um, to somebody who might come later down the road and then be pathogenic. Okay. So we, we don't want to have any type of resistance uh, being transferred to microbes at all. Okay. Um, even though, yes, we would like our host, cell, our host microbiome to be protected. <laughs> yeah, I asked because what happens to the antibiotics that are for the microbiota regulation? Uh, the, for which test? Uh, well, there are some antibiotics, like pharmaceutical yep. antibiotics for microbiota regulation. Yep. Yeah, um, and so ba so basically what happens is when you take an antibiotic that's prescribed, it's designed to kill the entire system. Yeah. So you're designed to wipe clean of your, your system. If you feel better and stop your antibiotic treatment before the end of the system, you are highly increasing your chances of getting antimicrobial resistance. So it's always important to finish a full antibiotic treatment. Then once it's clear, you then have uh, basically like a conditioning film, your personal microbiome is then going to recover faster than the pathogen. Okay. So even though it gets wiped clean, this is why you get symptoms. <laughs> you'll get like a fever, you'll get uh, a cold, sniffles, you'll get some type of reaction uh, with side effects when you have this particular type of treatment because your microbiome is also being affected. Mm -hmm. When you feel better, your microbiome has been recovered. Okay, so it kills everything. It kills everything. Okay, well, thank you. Yeah. Ideally, if there's resistance, it won't kill it. But. <laughs> yeah, thank you for having me. I've, I've really enjoyed it so far. Um, okay, yo sé las, eh, las últimas indicaciones. Recuerden, eh, mañana la sesión continúa, o bueno, el evento, en la Facultad de Química. No en el Instituto de Química, en la Facultad de Química. En el auditorio, um, no recuerdo si es el A o el B, pero están juntos. Están juntos, no se van a perder, va a haber mesa. Muchísimas gracias por estar aquí. Ha sido muy largo la sesión, pero bueno, muy interesante. Y mañana también van a estar muy interesantes y muy buenas. Muchas gracias, nos vemos mañana.